with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> If I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, March 31st, 2022. My name is Emma Vigeland, and for Sam Cedar, and this is the five time award winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America downtown brooklyn usa on the program today danielle lindeman sociology professor at lehigh university and author of true story what reality tv says about us and alexandra hunt will be joining us congressional candidate in pennsylvania's third district meanwhile russian and ukrainian officials have agreed to a temporary ceasefire in mariupol but right outside of kiev Russian forces have continued bombing areas that it said they would not. No promises should be taken at face value until peace is agreed upon. Fingers crossed here. The Biden administration has finally decided to end Title 42 used to turn away migrants at the border put in place by Trump during COVID. Long overdue. The change is set to take effect in late May. Biden has also implored Congress to approve billions of dollars in COVID relief aid as tens of millions of uninsured Americans are set to lose access to free testing. States are scaling back services, even though cases are on the rise in several Northeast and Southern states. Lisa Murkowski and Mitt Romney are mulling over whether or not to vote yes on Katanji Brown Jackson after Susan Collins announced that she will all but ensuring her confirmation to the court. The Republican Party, it's sane again. Not. Republican leader Kevin McCarthy says Madison Cawthorn has, quote, lost my trust. Well, yeah. Yeah, you you gave up all his secrets. Somebody talked about me doing coke, I would lose my trust too. I know. What kind of friend are you? And senators like Tom Tillis want him primaried. Makes you think. No more blow for Madison. I, it's just, you hate to see cancer culture just become such a driving force for a political party. Exactly. The Commerce Department, it's Orwellian. The Commerce Department has released new data showing that last year corporations had their best year since 1950. Hell yeah! 35% increase in profits, worker wages, 11% bump. Hmm. And lastly, Louisiana's Republican-led state legislature has overridden Democratic Governor John Bell Edwards' veto of a redistricted map that gerrymanders so it only has one majority black district out of six. One third of Louisiana's residents are are black. (laughs) Republicans are doing this all over the country. All this and more on today's program welcome to the show ladies and gentlemen it is a majority report thursday again we're coming up with uh little monikers for every day of the week except i don't think we have monday we have newsday tuesday we have hump day i don't like that one we got a majority report thursday and the casual friday but but what did we decide on monday funday monday funday monday did i say that like that oh oh bradley did it or you or an i am or you just take credit for it bradley that's That's the right way to go about it, things. Um, but before we get into things, I wanted to highlight this ivermectin story that came out yesterday. So um, right-wing media for months, I mean, that you don't hear much about it anymore. Well, to them, it's partially because COVID is over. <laughs> but for months, I kept hearing on right-wing shows, why aren't we looking into ivermectin? This shows a lot of promise. And, and I think we were fairly measured on our show. We made fun of certain... Uh, you know, Joe Rogan types and Joe Rogan guests. 
uh, calling it some sort of miracle cure, but we didn't rule out the possibility that it might mitigate some of the effects to an extent, even though it did not seem to be overwhelming evidence as the right suggested. We were open to that possibility. Yeah, the main problem that I had with it was uh, not so much to suggest that it might have some applicability towards COVID, but that there was a conspiracy uh, both uh, certain folks would have a li li limited to just the media was conspiring to make us scientists not able to study a drug, which is ridiculous. Um, but also there was folks more on the right wing side of things as opposed to like the contrarian grifter side of things that would suggest that it's all med doctors are in on this vast conspiracy right. to suppress a well big pharma cure. is exactly yeah as as they would profit from any ivermectin sales since yeah. big pharma makes ivermectin the idea being all these doctors that uh were working overtime for years um and watching people die in front of them um that they had a cure available to them and they just decided not to because they're actually pharma uh drones yeah uh, right, exactly. And there were some doctors, though, that still did prescribe ivermectin to people, sure. uh, Republican doctors, well, <laughs> most I, likely right wing not, doctors, but also plenty of doctors that thought that this new drug may have had some sort of effect and will try it out because guess what? It wasn't suppressed. Actually, there were trials all yes. over the world all the time. And now there's been a massive trial, a massive study in Brazil. So this is from The New York Times. A new study, which looked at more than 1,300 people infected with the coronavirus, effectively ruled out ivermectin as a useful treatment for COVID, the researchers said. The antiparasitic drug ivermectin, which has surged in popularity as an alternative treatment for COVID-19, despite a lack of strong research to back it up, showed no sign of alleviating the disease, according to results of a large clinical trial published on Wednesday. So the study was done in Brazil. They compared 1,300 people who received either ivermectin or a placebo. And Dr. David Bulwar, an infectious disease expert at the University of Minnesota, says, quote, there's really no sign of any benefit. For decades, ivermectin has been widely used to treat parasitic infections. Early in the pandemic, when researchers were trying thousands of old drugs against COVID-19, Laboratory experiments on cells suggested that ivermectin might block the coronavirus. At the time, skeptics pointed out that the experiments worked thanks to high concentrations of the drug, far beyond safe levels for people. Nevertheless, some doctors began prescribing ivermectin for COVID-19 despite a warning from the FDA that it was not approved for such use. All right, but now we've had some time. There have been studies. And this study, uh, I think it's the, the Brazil team is called the Together Team, found this. The Together Team reported on its ivermectin data that between March and August 2021, the researchers provided the drug to 679 patients over the course of three days. So the larger study was 1,300, but the people who got the drug were uh, 679 in total. The results were clear. Taking ivermectin did not reduce a COVID patient's risk of ending up in, a hosp in the hospital. The researchers zeroed in on different groups of volunteers to see if they experienced benefits that others didn't. For example, it might be possible that ivermectin only worked if taken early in an infection. But volunteers who took ivermectin in the first three days after a positive coronavirus test turned out to have worse outcomes than did those in the placebo group. And this New York Times piece concludes with Dr. Paul Sachs, an infectious disease expert at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, who was not involved in the Together uh, trial, says this. I welcome the results of the other clinical trials and will view them with an open mind. But at some point, it will become a waste of resources to continue studying an unpromising approach. Yeah, I mean, it was really gross the way people portrayed um, the ivermectin hustlers as anything what they were besides what they were is branding themselves as oracles to scientific truth. That's all they were interested in this story. And what they ended up doing is um, using th like things that are true about our pharmaceutical system, like um, pharmaceutical companies aren't motivated by the incentives that we want them to. Um, to... Which is how all conspiracy theories spread uh, to the degree that they sh 
to a larger degree because, or not conspiracy theories, but false information, if they have kernels of truth, which is that, yeah, big pharma does screw us. And it's to lead them into a predatory relationship with somebody who can provide them a monthly dosage of ivermectin because everyone will focus on like, oh, ivermectin is actually a lot cheaper than a single dose of like monoclonal antibodies. You you have to take it monthly. Like the, when, when we take, we watch this Brett Weinstein clip here of um, Brett Weinstein and the other Joe Rogan COVID gurus. Like we talk about all this Joe Rogan stuff. These guys here, Dark Horse uh, podcast from the Dark Horse podcast. Uh, and I, it, this was a while ago, um, and I got a, a longer article to sort of like read in uh, if you want to read in on these guys. But let's play this clip of the way they were talking about uh, yeah. ivermectin, just to get an idea of like why we say like if somebody listened to these guys and decided not to get the vaccine and then died like the free vaccine as opposed to the purchasing of ivermectin from big pharma on a monthly basis to take it prophylactically right okay just making clear in terms of like which route gives more money to big pharma yeah so brett asks a uh uh former uh healthcare ceo about this (laughs) um i should also point out that our viewers will have noticed that we are sitting here unmasked and i should point out that actually yeah, sure, we sweet. are in an interesting sense a model of something that i believe is not uh, on the public radar so if i'm correct you robert have had COVID. i've had COVID, and i've been fully vaccinated with moderna all right steve you have been vaccinated uh, fully vaccinated with moderna all right i am unvaccinated but i am on prophylactic ivermectin and the data actually Shocking as this will be to some people, the data suggests that prophylactic ivermectin is something like 100% effective at preventing people from contracting COVID when taken properly. So aside from the risk that possibly... So some people that that would be uh, shocking to would be the doctors and and clinical researchers that have studied that claim. And I want to put up this, uh, if you take that down, Bradley. 100% effective from contracting COVID. Contracting COVID. Yeah, not even hospitalization. No. Uh, which is an insane claim to make. And there's this um, this article here. I'll go to the top one second. Um, uh, I got another one here. It's called uh, on, I, on Vaccine Safety, Ivermectin, uh, and the Dark Horse Podcast and Investigation. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Medium wants me to sign in. Um, uh, and so this is David Fuller. He's a journalist and documentary maker uh, for Channel 4, the BBC, The Economist. This is a really long, it, it's 51 minute read there. So it's a really in-depth uh, discussion of this. And I cut out just to wait one more second, Bradley. Um, and what he says there is uh, uh, really inter- important as far as the prophylactic point. Um, I, I'm just going to read it. Um, okay, yeah. Because it's hard for me to do it up there. But, but. Uh, Brett and Heather uh, began their subsect paper with an argument that ivermectin should be lo- used as a prophylactic against COVID. Um, and uh, consider how Brett has called ivermectin something like 100% effective when taken properly in preventing catching COVID-19. This is a consequential claim. Being a claim on prophylaxis, this may lead people to take ivermectin instead of the vaccines. That's always the point. And everybody who obscured that point should feel ashamed and should feel guilty about leading people into uh, like a dumb media wormhole hole for this, like these grifters that are sh- absolute charlatans and they got people killed by- 100%. By, I mean, yeah. we can draw a direct connection with Dark Horse Podcast. Uh, we, we highlighted that on the show, but you know, it, there's a, a bunch of people that we probably don't know about. And all of this is just a very deadly uh, <laughs> trapeze, uh, performance or what do you call it that's when you walk across the tightrope yeah, tight right rope, yeah yeah, yeah tightrope <laughs> jeez um, more coffee for me but like i mean the in order to brand oneself as uh somebody providing unique information that is outside the main mainstream that means if you consume it you are also unique and you have access to special knowledge outside of societal norms that you might feel isolated from in, uh, for uh, different uh reasons yeah. um and in the end it really only serves the people who are putting out that kind of media content um when they're able to differentiate themselves in that way but also present as very scientific and measured and um appropriately uh, uh approaching these topics with like a, a clear eye then it's really just an, a, a way for them to dupe you and then make money for themselves um yeah because no, people don't, we're conditioned not to want to, 
feel a part of the collective and when it gives you some sort of like individual moral uh uh differentiator or you're able to perceive yourself as above society um then oh. th then th th that's tantalizing the weinsteins are pathologically exactly that these are guys who are let's just face it peter Thiel linked charlatans who are publicity stunt artists uh eric weinstein literally thinks that he and his brother and another sibling should all have nobel prizes for different sort of and, yeah. and they've and it's the it's this and he literally has a phrase for the uh distributed idea suppression complex that is the reason that they don't have their nobel prizes these people are absolute charlatans and jokes and anybody who couldn't see through that uh their credibility is in judgment as far as i'm concerned uh as far as the i, I don't blame um you know audiences of these folks i'm talking about media people right um well with that said we are going to take a quick break and when we come back we will be joined by danielle lindeman We are back and we are joined uh by danielle danielle uh am i saying this right lindeman correct okay great sociology professor at lehigh university and author of true story what reality tv says about us uh, danielle thanks so much for being here really appreciate it thanks for having me on of course um i went to lafayette uh so uh -oh. I'm the to dislike you based on that rivalry although i have a hard time getting emotionally i even when i was in college i had a hard time getting emotionally invested in the rivalry i'm not sure if you feel the same i've never been to a single football game so i'm a football fan but like it's such small time uh, uh football i just couldn't get myself to care but anyway um really appreciate you having uh, you coming on despite our differences there hopefully we um, can resolve them hopefully now uh, i am an admitted reality tv watcher um and i care about it probably to a degree that like you know i maybe i shouldn't but i get addicted to it obviously i i'm sure though a lot of people are asking we're a political podcast like why should we care about reality tv from a sociological perspective Sure. So I'm certainly not here to tell you not to care about it. In fact, the, uh, the opposite, right? Um, so one of the things about reality TV is that more people, a, a large number of people are watching it. Vastly more people are watching these shows than not. Whether they admit it to others or not, they're watching. Um, and research shows that the material on these shows influences the way we kind of move and think and act in the world. So it's this kind of immense cultural juggernaut and whether you like it or not, whether you think it's junk or you think it's delicious, it doesn't really matter. It's still sort of impacting our everyday lives. And that includes, you know, how we vote, right? Um, or how we think in a kind of broader political sense. So there's certainly reason to care about reality TV, whether one particularly cares for it or not. In many ways, because one, it, it, it's a huge uh, part of our culture, so it replicates culture and it uh, also influences it as well, um, which I, I want to dive into uh, with you. But let's, I guess, t uh, talk about the beginning of reality TV and when it came uh, into being. So. You know, you write that most people market as uh, starting in the early 2000s with Survivor, but the 
I didn't even put this together. The fact that it really exploded after uh, during the writer's strike in 2007 when, you know, so it comes out a bit out of a labor issue. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so it's sort of, depending on who you ask, you'll get a different answer in terms of when reality TV began. A lot of people actually pinpoint sort of the real world, right? That initial season of the real world as the first reality TV show. Um, you know, Survivor, though, really was the first kind of reality show that was such a juggernaut that it really showed, you know, from a production side, how lucrative reality TV could be. Right. And so this is really what inspired the networks, you know, kind of keep producing these shows. And then again, you know, a few years later with the with the labor strike, the only shows that were really being produced were ones that didn't require writers, even though some reality shows do have writers, um, but they didn't, didn't require writers. So we again saw this kind of proliferation of reality shows. What was there to watch that was new TV at that time? It was reality TV. Right? And we've actually seen that duplicated a little bit in the early days of the pandemic as well, where again, what was the TV that we had to watch? It was Tiger King, right? It was these reality shows Love that were kind of- Love yeah. is Blind. Love is Blind, and then, you know, Brazil, right? So it was these kind of shows where, you know, they didn't require, they, didn't, they weren't unionized, they didn't require writers, right? They just kept on kind of being produced. Um, and again, kind of led to these large audiences of people who might not have been watching them otherwise. Right. Can you talk a bit more about the lack of unionization and really uh, the cheapness of it as well? Because uh, you don't have to deal if you're a TV executive with uh, these pesky writers. They're asking for more money. They're asking for better uh, uh, working conditions, et cetera. With reality TV, it's quick, easy, and cheap, and oftentimes contestants are paid in exposure rather than actual wages. Right, exactly. Especially with this sort of rise in influencer culture, right? People are, you know, want to go on these shows even if they're not being paid directly because they think there's going to be, you know, a payoff down the road. Well, I'll just, you know, sell my skincare line and that's going to be my payoff. Um, yeah, from the production side, it's really a no-brainer why these shows are being produced and why they're proliferating, right? Because they don't have to, there's like, so much less overhead. They don't have to buy sets, right? They don't have to pay writers in a lot of cases. They don't have to compensate the performers, the people that appear on the shows. Um, oftentimes the, the cast and the crews are not unionized. Um, so again, it's kind of a huge, you know, ethical issues aside, which is another question, right? Um, it is kind of a huge kind of money saver. Um, so of course, from the production side, we're gonna see these shows proliferate especially if then people are going to watch them yeah and then you talk about influencer culture like look you know i watch the bachelor uh or the bachelorette right and the the big payoff for them is i don't think they the contestants get paid on the show right but then they get the cat they get notoriety and then they leave and they have big influencer uh or, or big instagram accounts and then they can sell their things on instagram right and I feel like that's oddly reflective of how uh, labor is in regular life as well in this current climate where, you know, you work for us, maybe you're an unpaid intern, maybe you're a gig worker, and the promise of getting paid later is dangled in front of you like a carrot. I mean, that's it, there's some symmetry there that I think is kind of interesting, and I'm, I'm hoping you could explore it a bit. Yeah, it's interesting because sort of people in, in creative industries, sort of artistic workers have kind of always felt that, right? This sort of the gig economy where you're going to do something and you might be paid in favors or you might be paid later, you might be paid in exposure. Um, so that sort of always existed for people in creative industries, especially, you know, artistic workers. Um, whether you think reality TV stars qualify as artistic workers might be another question. Um, but yeah, so now we're kind of seeing more broadly this kind of labor structure where it's, you know, these kind of short term gig jobs where you might not be compensated with minimum wage, but you still feel like it's worth it to you to participate because you feel like there might be some other payoff, be it exposure or some sort of monetary payment um, down the road. So I do think it reflects the larger structure of work in that sense. Although as we've seen, you know, during, you know, the pandemic, people are now kind of pushing back against that, right? And we've really seen a trend toward employees now really kind of demanding fair compensation and pushing back against these kind of 
unpaid internship type positions or lower paid work that's not technically minimum wage, but still somehow legal. Um, so it'll be interesting to see kind of how that how that unfolds in the future. Yeah, um, I, I appreciate you kind of unpacking that 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 part for us. Um, so I guess I, I really liked how your book is structured in terms of the chapters. Um, it, it seems to start uh, from reality TV being not innocuous, like you you begin with the the Luann quote from Real Housewives of New York, um, which I is my probably my favorite reality show of all time. And then so it, it, it's so good, right? And it 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 can it gets you know progressively darker, honestly, until we're at uh, toddlers and tiaras and like Honey Boo Boo and, and other shows that I that's that stuff is I can't even wade into that because it it scares me a little bit the child pageants and the, I, that that stuff is too dark for me. But um, I guess let's we can start in, in part one. Um, where you examine the self, couples, groups, families, and childhood there. I mean, why did you decide to divide uh, these the, your book into these two sections? Um, and am I right to characterize it as getting a bit darker as it goes on? I think that is correct. Yeah, I mean, so again, you know, I'm a sociologist, and I really wanted the book, book to kind of serve dual purpose. So I'm a sociologist, but I'm also a fan. I'm a reality TV fan, unabashedly. Um, I know you say you're a fan in kind of this confessional way, but I think it's okay to say loud and proud yeah, that we are right, reality right. TV fans, <laughs> right? Um, but I, so I'm a sociologist, but I'm also a fan. So I, I sort of wanted this book to serve dual purposes. So on one level, I'm explaining what reality TV can teach us about ourselves, applying a sociological lens to it. But I also kind of wanted to sort of, introduce people to sociology at the same time. And so the book kind of goes into kind of the major kind of subject areas of sociology, sociology of families, sociology of childhood, gender, race, class, um, these kind of large kind of subdisciplinary areas of sociology, um, while hopefully not being too academic, right? Hopefully still being kind of a fun book that people can pick up, even if they're not interested in learning about the subdisciplines of sociology. Um, but yes, I agree it does get darker. I sort of start off talking about sort of smallest social unit, which is the individual, and what can reality TV teach us about ourselves as individuals, right? Like Countess Luann, she's an individual. The other cast members, mainly Bethany, right? You know, always yes. accuse her of being unreal, right? That she's just performing. But I sort of point out that we're all like Countess Luann. We're all kind of performing on the different stages of our lives. The difference with reality show stars is that they're just doing it in this more kind of heightened public way. But we're all performing every day and we're giving uneven and different performances depending upon the people to whom we're performing. Um, so I started that kind of smallest level and then kind of broaden out what does it teach us about kind of small groups? What does it teach us about families? And then when we get into the kind of large scale social inequalities, what, what can it teach us about class, race, gender, sexuality, and how those things are intertwined? Yes, then I think it does get at its darkest. Um, but hopefully in the conclusion, I bring it around again and say like, yes, reality TV can show us some really ugly, grotesque things about ourselves, but it also shows us beauty if, if we kind of know where to look. So let's start, I guess, with some of those smaller groups in terms of uh, couples and and what reality TV reinforces and says about um, relationships. Um, because what's interesting about reality TV, and you write this too, I'm paraphrasing, is that it it kind of, even though it seems maybe to like uh, a Republican politician uh, hedonistic and... Um, N not uh close to god or something it actually reinforces very conservative social conditioning particularly in like the heteronormative way that the bachelor which is the number one reality dating tv show does um can you talk a little bit about that yeah not close to god i mean it's really interesting actually a former reality star just emailed me today and said you're doing the lord's work and i was like i don't know about that like i just wrote a sociological <laughs> book <laughs> about reality tv but yeah it's so paradoxical right because you would expect that these shows right are they're filled with what we would call deviants in sociology so people who are behaving in ways that are outside the norm so it's like zany people in outrageous situations 
But at the end of the day, reality TV really kind of confirms for us some of our kind of most conservative social ideals. And by conservative, I don't necessarily mean politically conservative, although sometimes those ideals align, oftentimes those ideals align with kind of conservative ideology, but they show us how we think in really narrow ways about what we consider to be kind of legitimate and real and normal and healthy and how we're kind of unyielding in how we think about those things. So everything from how we think about how a woman should act, right? Or how, you know, a person of color should act to, you know, what pants are the appropriate pants to buy. Reality TV for all of its zaniness kind of shows us again, the kind of narrow categories and roles and expectations that we have and that, that kind of still persist. Right. I mean, I, I'm I'm reminded and we can get into the racial component, too. But in terms of like how specific people can act in The Bachelorette, the first Bachelorette uh, of color was Rachel Lindsay. And I've heard her talk about she's a really smart person um, and definitely my favorite of the leads on that show. She's talked about how um, to succeed and to be considered for that lead role in that position she had to never present herself as angry because she was black uh be exceptional because she's a lawyer have all of these degrees show off show herself in that certain light um and outside of the perception that depiction of black people on that very popular show the 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 black people are not portrayed <laughs> you're either exceptional right. or you're outside of the conversation Right. Yeah. I mean, it's become kind of a, and yes, the Bachelor franchise has, again, made efforts at diversity in recent years. Um, you know, a lot of people would say kind of too little, too late. And they lost a bunch, of viewers. They and lost they lost a bunch, a bunch of, viewers. of viewers, which says mm -hmm. something about, you know, American culture as well, um, that people maybe don't want to tune in. And by people, I mean white people um, don't want to, maybe don't want to, are less or kind of more reticent to tune in to see um, a person of color in a protagonist role. But prior to that, right, it really was this show where, you know, middle class, white, conventionally hot heterosexual people linked up with each other, right? And there were people of color on there, um, but they were sort of never seen to be, shown to be kind of in serious roles. They never, never they were seldom shown to be kind of serious contenders for kind of that final slot, right? Um, and, you know, I say in the book that, you know, aside from the, the kind of moral question or what of what the shows or the producers have the kind of moral imperative to do, which I think is a different question. Um, these shows, you know, teach us though how racially stratified we still are as a society because a majority of people still do end up dating and marrying people who are homophilous to them, who are like them in demographic ways, who are of their same race, who are of their same socioeconomic class. So in that way, you know, The Bachelor may seem absurd to us, but it's, it is kind of a funhouse mirror of these trends um, that are actually happening in our broader culture. Right. I, you know what? Uh, I'm sorry if I'm um, going on a bit of a tangent here, but I, I've thought about this a little bit in terms of like American Idol in the early 2000s. And, and there were so many parts about the way that show was produced that said so much about where we were at, like post 9-11. There was a lot of a lot of patriotism, um, a lot of producer manipulation where like you know they would bring out somebody terrible at singing you're there to mock it mock them and then a beautiful story of somebody that you know lived uh worked really hard and and pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and here they are and you know carrie underwood wins it all mm -hmm. like th it really was i that show honestly more than and maybe it's just because i'm looking at it uh because it was in the past th those are the 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 purity of that show in terms of uh, how people did not were not familiar with the reality TV trappings at that per uh, during that period, and they just reinforced so many of the, uh, the so much of 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 what the, the U.S. was going through at that time, flag waving and um, uh, also like these uh, heteronormative and and pro white kind of uh, trends that I. I that show even more than others, I feel like says you can you can take a snapshot of that and look at like this is what America was like in two thousand five. 
Oh, absolutely. But in some ways, it's still what America is like, right? right. We're still, right, with flag waving and we're still performing gender and we're still heteronormative um, and we're still like, you know, clutching that conservatism. So, yeah, but but even more so at the time. Absolutely. Yeah. So I guess uh, we can move a little bit. Uh, I'd love to move into to part two when you explore the issues of class, race, gender, sexuality, and, and deviance as well. Um, I know this is a big picture question, but in that second part, um, what did you find in terms of what reality TV tells us about us, ourselves and uh, for those kind of broader sociological themes? Um, and 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 I'm um, how it influences in us as well. Sure. So that is a big picture question. Um, sort of in a broad sense, reality TV shows us kind of our largest scale social inequalities, right? The fact that we are still strongly divided in a hierarchical way by race, by gender, by class, and by sexuality in ways that also intersect with each other. So when, we when it comes to class, reality TV kind of takes us on a tour through the American class system, not the entire class system, the very poor are not often shown. Um, but, you know, from Honey Boo Boo's cheese ball jar to the Real Housewives $25,000 sunglasses, it really kind of shows us that spectrum in a way that other forms of reality, other forms of television don't always. And it also teaches us about the kind of cultural narratives that we tell that keep these inequalities going, that kind of serve to justify or legitimate these inequalities. So if we tell narratives about kind of working class or lower class people as kind of buffoons, um, uneducated buffoons, as in the case of a honey boo boo or a tiger king, that kind of helps us justify for ourselves the fact that this class system is so unequal. If we rely on kind of racial stereotypes that have traveled down all the way from, say, minstrelsy, right? If we kind of clutch those stereotypes, that allows us to kind of justify or explain away the fact that we are still a nation that is sort of deeply scarred by racial inequality. Um, and similarly with gender, right? If we if we have these kind of um, what sociologist Patricia Hill Collins calls controlling images, if we have these controlling images of kind of women on our screen of behaving in these silly ways, we can just look at them and say, oh, yeah, that's women. Women are silly. Right. That helps us justify the fact that we still have a huge wage gap. Right. That there's still discrimination by gender. Um, so I think kind of the overarching theme of those last chapters is you know, reality TV really shows us in gargantuan caricature these large scale social inequalities, but not only that, but the kind of cultural narratives that we tell to kind of justify them or explain them away. I'm wondering if you could expand a bit on the class point, because something that sticks out to me is that, um, you know, <laughs> we've had uh, we will respond to right wingers on our show a lot who talk about working class class people and they're image of a working class person is a white person um and like there that's fetishized to a degree and so like yes you know someone like honey boo boo they're portrayed as buffoons but they're more working class and they they have portrayal on reality tv at least right even though th there's a darkness there where they basically you know, juice up that kid with like red bull literally and stuff with go-go juice yeah and go, mm -hmm. yeah to keep her going um that's that there that's why I can't watch that show because it, it it's pretty dark. but um, but at least they're portrayed. I mean, like I don't outside of there's very little portrayal of non-white working class people in reality television. Um, that's true. I, yeah, I mean, what do you, what do you think that says about us? I mean, I think in some ways, it's kind of easier to justify the kind of racially suspect portrayals of people of color when they're not working class. So there, there are very few, right, portrayals of working class people of color, but there are a lot of portrayals of kind of upwardly mobile, upper middle class, supposedly moneyed black women. Mm. And a lot of kind of buffoonish portrayals of women kind of in that category. Or if they're category. fighting, right? There's yeah. like, you know, uh, the, that reinforces that stereotype as well. 
Right, the kind of quick to anger, kind of that kind of stereotype. Um, and I think maybe, I mean, I, I think maybe that's because it, it's maybe easier for people to stomach when it's, oh, but they're, we're not making fun of poor people, we're making fun of rich people, so it's okay even though we're kind of mobilizing these racist stereotypes that have been in our culture for, for hundreds of years, somehow maybe that's, we feel that it's more justifiable because, oh, because they're not downtrodden. They're, they're these rich women who are, you know, who are on our screens. Right. Um, so I, I guess um, another big picture question for you, you, you write about how reality TV, I, I think, you said regressive is a good way to categorize some of the themes unless I'm I wrote that down incorrectly. No, that's uh, correct. But but what about the nature of it makes it regressive as opposed to transgressive? Like is there something in the form um of reality television as opposed to other forms of art or entertainment that 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 cause it to trend in that way or is that just like a a critique that can be more broadly applied to television or something in general? So I, I think it can be applied to media in general, although I do say reality TV can be transgressive. And it there are certain instances in which it has been transgressive. And I think it has the immense power because it is this cultural drug or not, has the immense power to be transgressive. Um, but in reality, it is largely regressive, right? And I think part of that is because it's supposedly reality, right? Even though we all kind of have skepticism about whether how real reality TV is. Right. So we have some skepticism about that, but we kind of still see it as reality. So when you put kind of stereotypes on a reality show or you have people engaging in these really regressive ways, it's kind of easy to kind of hand wave and say, well, but they're just real people. They're just showing real people. Um, if you had scripted shows that had people acting in those ways, I don't know if they would make it to air. Um, I think they would be. Yeah, I don't know if they would make it to air. So I think, you know, reality TV kind of gets away with a lot um, in terms in, in terms of regr regressiveness because people see it as kind of really real and just people kind of being themselves. So it is something that's inherent in the form, I believe. Interesting. And, and something that's also inherent in the f uh, form is like the dynamic of parasocial relationships. Like, you know, what what makes it I mean, uh, I feel on a very small level, I experience this, you know, people think they know me because they watch our show, for uh, example. Um, but it's a much larger uh, scale on reality TV where you feel like you're watching people's individual lives. Like there's voyeurism element to it, but there's also, a, I feel like, a, a way for people to feel like they're connected without actually being connected. Uh, do, do you think that that's something that, you know, also says something about where we are in terms of lack of connectivity in an internet age to a degree. Yeah. So this, for me, this is kind of one of the big paradoxes of reality TV is that it's sort of this supposed to be this guilty pleasure. We're not supposed to admit that we watch it. And when we do watch it, sometimes it is for this voyeurism kind of train wreck. We're not like those people over there, but at the same time, studies show that again, right. We gravitate toward reality TV is filled with archetypes. And we gravitate and we hold on to those archetypes who remind us of ourselves. So we are more likely to kind of form what's known as these parasocial relationships where like if you're watching a scripted show, right, you're, you know, am I more of a carrier? Am I more of a Miranda? Right. But you don't necessarily feel like you have that sort of that relationship with that person to the extent that you do when it's Kim Kardashian being herself ostensibly. And then you can also follow her on social media. And I think Again, that's inherent inherent in the form of the fact that these people are performing ostensibly as themselves, right? Which similarly in your case, right? So people kind of feel like they know you as you, not just as a character. But then also, again, kind of inherent in the form of reality TV has been this kind of multi-platform approach where you can engage with it on multiple levels. So you're not just watching the show, but then you're going online and you're tweeting at Kim and you're playing her video game and you're buying her skincare line. So that really reinforces that kind of parasocial relationship that you have with her. Um, and it's commodifiable. It it's commodifiable yes. as well, obviously. Um, Absolutely. They perfected that. <laughs> the Kardashians. Absolutely. The Kardashians, you know, people say they're famous just for being famous. They haven't done anything to hasten their ascent. I mean, 
that's that's always been true. There have always been people who are famous for being famous, like royalty, right? Um, but at the same time, I, I kind of push back on that because I do think they they were able to commodify themselves in a really kind of crafty way that has persisted for relatively a long time in reality TV years. Like two decades. They've outlasted everybody. They outlasted I know, I know. And just when you thought they were gone, they're back on Hulu. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I'll probably be watching. I know. Um, <laughs> we all will. Let's be honest. Uh, lastly, I, I, I can't let you go without talking about the dynamic of uh, the fact that we had a reality TV show host as our president. <laughs> so, like, that's kind of the ultimate, uh, the ultimate validation of what you're saying here and, like, how it, I think important it is for us to understand this cultural zeitgeist. Like, he was a product of reality TV in terms of how he commodified himself, made himself, branded himself, and that branding was so strong, plus the racist stuff, and it brought him to the presidency. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. He really was and is a master of kind of capitalizing on the kind of trappings and tropes of reality TV. Everything from, you know, the cliffhanger big reveal. I'm going to tell you tonight who my next Supreme Court justice pick is. Tune in. And then everyone would kind of clamor to tune in. Oh, wait, just kidding. It's going to be tomorrow. Everyone would clamor to tune in, right, to, again, mobilizing these broad archetypes like the angry woman or the sorry, nasty woman or the bad ombre, right, that people could kind of um, grab onto and that resonated with people, especially people who had this kind of ingrained, which we all do to some extent, right? Had this kind of ingrained sexism and racism. Um, so yeah, speaking of people who are able to use the form, you know, who are masters of the form, I would really say that, that Trump is in that category. Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, can't thank you enough for being here. Danielle Lindemann, a sociology professor at Lehigh University and author of True Story, What Reality TV Says About Us. Danielle, uh, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks again for having me. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we will talk a bit about Susan Collins, and then we will be joined in a little bit by Alexandra Hunt, congressional candidate in Pennsylvania's 3rd District. Be right back. We are back. We are back. Um, let's talk a little bit about SCOTUS and uh, Susan Collins here. So yesterday, I think it was yesterday, Susan Collins um, confirmed that she will support Judge Katanji Brown Jackson's nomination to the Supreme Court. They met for an hour, uh, Susan Collins says. She'll, she'll explain here. And that's why that's how she came to that determination. Look, I'm I'm happy she's supporting her, but that's pretty much BS. But first, let's hear what, what Collins has to say. Well, I had been evaluating Judge Jackson's record uh, for some time. I applied the same standards that have applied to the other Supreme Court justices for whom uh, I have cast votes. And um, I met with her for an hour and a half before the hearing, watched much of the hearing, and then I met with her yesterday for an hour. At the conclusion of that extensive review and conversation, I came to the conclusion that she clearly had the credentials, the experience, the qualifications, and the integrity that I look for in a Supreme Court justice. I'm sure uh, that I won't agree with every decision that she casts on the court. I haven't agreed with every decision that any of the justices for whom I voted have uh, cast on the court. I also don't agree with all the decisions that she's made as a district judge, but I wouldn't expect that. 
But there's no doubt that the APA, which gave it its highest, gave her uh, its highest rating of unanimously well qualified, uh, reflects my views that she is well qualified. Okay. So, um, look, again, I'm happy that she made this decision, but. I don't want to give her any credit here. I mean, Susan Collins, the the standards that she applies, what she says, she applied the same standards that she did in terms of um, interviewing and making a decision uh, based on the the past uh, Supreme Court nominees. Now, she did vote against Amy Coney Barrett. Um, that's correct, right? She voted against Amy Coney Barrett, but she voted yes on Kavanaugh. Hmm. It's a little weird because Amy Coney Barrett had a pretty uh, seamless confirmation process uh, thanks to Dianne Feinstein praising her endlessly and not really having the wits to conduct um, said said uh, confirmation process. Um, but But the issue here is that she doesn't have a universal standard even though she's claiming to do so. She is pro-choice as a branding exercise, and she makes her decisions based on these Supreme Court nominations because it is a branding exercise. And she she chooses the path of least resistance and the less risky path every time. So uh, there were, the, Katanji Brown-Jackson was going to get confirmed no matter what. But she feels like she can get some sort of cr uh, credit here by voting for her um they uh she didn't she realized her vote was not going to be necessary for amy coney barrett so she didn't uh give it there um and yet with kavanaugh she realized it might be a little bit tighter so despite his like incredibly belligerent testimony she decided to vote for him anyway um what frustrates me here is that she probably will get credit for this and she is a she uses her branding in order to normalize the Republican Party when the results of what she actually advocates for and pushes for and the nominees that she votes yes on, there's really no difference in terms of the outcome, but it's just the way that she brands it and presents herself. So, you know, McConnell gave Republicans the green light to not push so hard on Katanji Brown Jackson. Someone like Lindsey Graham uses this as an opportunity to further his branding by, you know, spitting everywhere and yelling at her, Ted Cruz same deal, Josh Hawley same deal. For them, that's what they're appealing to, right? But they are the Republican Party. Susan Collins is a complete outlier, and the standards that she uses have nothing to do with their judicial philosophy. If she was really pro-choice, she wouldn't have confirmed both uh, Kavanaugh and, and Amy Coney Barrett. It's based on how can I show myself as some reasonable centrist, moderate Republican. Um, McConnell doesn't want them fighting hard on this nomination because it doesn't really change. The well, it's like the context. Look at the scoreboard. Like, yes. They've already packed this thing. The idea that you wouldn't support who the Democrats put up after yeah, like supporting, and also Democrats supported uh, Gorsuch, uh, like uh, Donnelly Mansion and uh, Heitkamp, which was uh, just in even that one on the in the wake of like the Merrick Garland thing, which another like gosh, Democrats are so bad. But um, yeah, uh, like the idea that like you wouldn't let the Democrats seat someone on the court. Well, it's like it's clear that if you didn't do that, you're pushing it too far, and you're. I mean, not that you know. Who knows how far you could push it before the Democrats actually do something about reforming the court and putting it back in its place, which is um, subservient to Congress, in my opinion. Um, but uh, yeah, like we have this this little pageantry about who can be a states person um, and Susan Collins wins, I guess, today. Yeah. Again, behind the scenes, they're all making these determinations based on political calculations. They're appointing political actors to a lifetime appointment on a court. And they're going to make policy decisions because we have enabled judicial review and the right wing has been aggressive about it. And McConnell has the luxury of allowing for, you know, 
like it's the end of the game and you're up by 20 all right you can allow them to get a few chunk chunk plays uh yeah, uh get some highlights yeah get some right put the kids out there on the court or or you can get allow them to get some uh chunk plays so you're uh, d- you don't play too aggressive defense if you're using a football analogy yeah. and say they score a touchdown with a minute left you're already up by two scores like that's how yeah. he, he perceives this and pra- so then the and then and susan wouldn't... collins is padding her stats yeah yeah practice the fun stuff you wouldn't do in a close game yeah like uh cue it on stuff exactly all right folks uh we are going to take a quick break just to uh set up the shot here and then we are going to be joined by alexandra hunt candidate for congress in pennsylvania We are back and we are joined by Alexandra Hunt, candidate for Congress in Pennsylvania's third district. Alexandra, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So uh, let's just go through your platform a little bit here. Medicare for all, Green New Deal, uh, ending cash bail, your pro-wealth tax, housing as a human right, uh, protecting tribal sovereignty. I guess I don't have to ask you if you consider yourself a progressive. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> the, the, the details. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. So, um what what inspired you to run for Congress? The the inspiration actually came out of a lot of uh community pain when the pandemic first struck the the lack of proper response and resources that we got to the ground in the community in PA3 in Philadelphia was uh heartbreaking and completely unacceptable. And so it was really, our lines were just far too long. And that was what inspired me to run to try to change that. And and you have like a personal story that I know the the New York Post ran with. We actually covered it on the show. Um, You know, the the fact that you had, you went to college, your parents were were teachers, uh, you racked up some student debt and you had to work your way through college. Um, And, you know, that's, uh, or, or or I'm sorry if I'm characterizing it incorrectly, but you had to work in terms of like all the student debt that you'd accrued. Um, New York, the, the New York Post ran with the fact that you had had worked as a stripper before and uh, cl- clutched their pearls about how outrageous it was. And we read this article on air and everything that you were saying in it was just completely um, common sense. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the reaction to, to your campaign um, and really, I guess your story in, in that area, um, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so I, I worked in college and I, I actually started out and continued in the restaurant business and I was working as a server, but I was working on campus at our only bar on campus and I, one, wasn't being treated super well by my peers. They they kind of looked down at folks who had to work throughout school. And two, I just wasn't making enough money there for it to be substantive to paying my bills. 
and buying books and normal expenses that you have as a student. So I started to look for other ways to make good money. And uh, it, it dawned on me that I've heard you can make a lot of money as a stripper. And so I started to look into that and started to work at a club. And that was, I, I did make good money. I also learned a lot about how to raise money, which is something that we're proving we're doing very well on the campaign trail. So there is a transferable skill set from stripping to running for office. Nice. And uh, I think that they tried to shame me for it. And I, they just took an angle that we pretty much inoculated ourselves against by being forthcoming with this fact that yes, I worked as a stripper and that doesn't make me any less of a candidate. Right. And I, I appreciate how you kind of owned it and you uh, talked about how you would not be uh, a corporate whore essentially, um, or mm -hmm. what well, I forget the exact uh, phrasing of, of the, the shirt. Um, but it was, it's, it's pretty great to get out ahead of it because like, you know, Papers like that will try to run with the scandalous headline when the real scandal, obviously, is that a significant majority of our elected representatives do not respond to their constituents. They respond to the people that pay for them. And of course, you're not taking uh, any corporate donations. Uh, so so can you talk a little bit about that decision? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that that so the the phrase is i may have danced for money but i'm no corporate whore and that's the t-shirt and sweatshirt that that we've been running with and the basis of that is we're a fully grassroots campaign we're only taking money from everyday people and our while we've raised over half a million with uh over nine thousand donors our average contribution is 36 dollars and it, it shows that we are backed by the community. We're a working campaign and it, it, that we're, we're making honest money. Whereas my opponent is one of the majority in the Democratic Party for taking corporate money and has almost boastfully said in, in interviews that he only answers to his donors. He only answers to his corporate donors. And that's how he, the people who put him in, in that seat and that leads to deep neglect and a lack of resources in the community, which is what inspired me to run in the first place. Right. Can, so talk a little bit more about your opponent. Um, I mean, um, uh, Dwight Evans, you're primarying him. Um, what are some of the positions that he holds that are contrary to the ones that you're uh, running on? For starters, uh, overturning Citizens United is is a an important piece. And uh, he, if, if that happens, he won't be able to have a campaign because he doesn't know how to run with the community support, only the establishment support. Uh, in terms of environmental justice and climate action, he does not support the Green New Deal. And you can follow the money trail and see that he's personally invested in the fossil fuel industry and Exxon Mobil. Uh, it, for universal health care, which is something that we absolutely need, especially in the middle of a pandemic, he's backed by private health insurance companies and big pharma and cannot support Medicare for all because of that. With education reform, something that I'm very passionate about because of my parents being teachers and that I know this is the pathway to opportunity for young people. He, he has uh, defunded our public schools and founded his own charter school. And so it's really just mm -hmm. a matter of, of uh, his stances differ from ours because you, if you follow the money, that's, that's how he reached his stances. Yeah, I mean the fact that he founded his own charter school. I mean that speaks volumes, right? Um, that 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 that's not just a policy position that you support. That's something that you're actively uh, doing outside of your elected office position, or or, or uh, that's you're so passionate about defunding public schools that you're doing it yourself. Uh, so so that that does uh, speak volumes. Um, your districts in or your potential districts in Philly. Um, Pennsylvania's third district. You, you talk on your website about how you're pas passionate about uh, criminal justice reform. Obviously, the the DA in in uh, Philly, Larry Krasner, has been aggressive on this front. Where do your positions align with his? Um, and how do you see if you were to be elected to office, you potentially working with him uh, to make 
you know, Philly a progressive city in that area or, or continue making it, it that? If, if you speak with D.A. Krasner, he often talks about the, the limitations of his role and how that has led to a lot of blame for the current state of the district uh, on his shoulders and his office's shoulders. He needs the support of legislation. He, he believes in second chances, as do I, and he does not have the, the resources or the legislative support to uh, create compassionate re entry programs, which is what people need, because when you are a returning citizen, you you come back into uh, everyday life, you might not have a home, health insurance is incredibly hard to afford, you might not be able to get a job because of the stigma that is associated with it, who knows what your social support is and your your mental health capacity is, and so just you're set up with, with it's you against the world, and there there needs to be programs in place to make reentry possible, to a, dig, a dignified life possible and probable and and compassionate reentry. Yeah, I mean, I, I I couldn't agree more. And it's it's great to hear uh, this rhetoric and like these ideas uh, multiplying in Philly and Philadelphia. You know, we're here in New York, so uh, a few hours away. I'm I'm hoping that more cities uh, start to adopt these stances, but. You know, I, I said this the other day. I really think progressives need to pay a bit more attention to Pennsylvania because there's a lot of great progressive candidates like yourself uh, coming out of Pennsylvania right now. We interviewed Summer Lee last week on the show um, out of Pittsburgh. And of course, we, we spoke to John Featherman, I think, last year. Um, can you talk a bit about uh, what you're seeing in your state in terms of uh, the progressive swell, especially the because... It's a unique situation there. You have a Democratic governor, a Republican obstructionist legislature that's kind of, that was uh, quick to side with Donald Trump and his lies about the election. Um, and yet, out of all of that, there's some really strong progressive candidates coming out of your state. Yeah, I, I think progressive candidates answer to the need of the community, and the need of the community is to have government that works for the people. And so what, what we're seeing is a lot of posturing on the on both sides, both the Republican side and the Democratic side, and, and nothing's getting for the people. And so you have candidates that are born from that frustration and motivated to actually push the party, the Democratic Party, in the direction of working for people. And that that's what Summer Lee comes out of. That's what uh, John Fetterman comes out of. I was a supporter of Summer Lee's uh, before she even decided to run for Congress, because she, in the state legislature, which is GOP run, she was willing to be brave enough to push forward a bill. It was unsuccessful, but to decriminalize sex work. So I, I think that she's brave, and I think she's a wonderful candidate. And uh, on top of that, PA3, the district that I'm running in, is the most Democratic district in the nation. So in the role that it plays in Pennsylvania state politics is that it can shift the the statewide seats if we get enough people motivated to come out and vote. But people aren't motivated by the status quo. They're not motivated by complacency. So we need to have candidates that uh, motivate people by the tangible differences they'll make in their lives. And that's someone like John Fetterman and, and like myself running in PA3. Absolutely. And lastly, um... You know, I I feel that what is making this new crop of progressive candidates strong is the embrace of the labor movement um, and how there has been a resurgence in people understanding the value of their labor and the power that they hold. Um, what What is your position and, and would you support, say, the PRO Act, go even further to support unions if you were elected uh, to office? Absolutely. I I think this whole uh, profit over people stance that we see recurring in several different industries undermines labor. And uh, so absolutely hard support for the PRO Act. The origin of unions is in Philadelphia. So uh, you, you don't you, you need the support of the union and the labor movement in order to be able to run. And you can't undermine it by by going to corporations that often try to union bust. 
Um, so heavy support for labor. I'm, I'm, I consider myself a worker, not a boss. And in our campaign's goal to build an education to opportunity pipeline, that has to be supported by the labor movement. Well, Alexandra Hunt, uh, Pennsylvania's third district, where can people support you find out more about your campaign? You can check us out online at huntforcongress.com, spell everything out. We are on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitter, Alexandra Hunt for Congress. Awesome. Um, well, and people can buy some of those really cool t-shirts uh, too if you if you if you decide to do so. Uh, sorry if I butchered the the tagline on there at first, but I appreciate you clarifying it. Uh, Alexandra Hunt, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Have a good rest of your day. You too. All right, folks, with that, we are going to head into the fun half, where we'll be joined by the illustrious Brandon Sutton and the also illustrious Matt Binder. But first, Matt, what happened on Left Reckoning last night? Yeah, we had Andrew Perez of the uh, the lever. The lever. The lever, damn. I just can't do that. It's okay. Uh, Lever News, uh, formerly known as the Daily Poster, uh, talking about a number of stories about how Christian Cinema, uh, a big pharma uh, sort of um, a lobbying group, has cinemas back and has it's, it's, these ads. We're all used to them now, but it's like we love the way she stands up for us Arizonans mm -hmm. with the you know, and it's it's just a group that has like a mansion or like uh, uh, the billion addresses of McMansion in Northern Virginia. Um, <laughs> And we also talked about the Koch brothers going after the EPA and saying uh, the EPA needs Congress's approval to basically tie its shoes. Um, and also uh, this Fetterman uh, story where Connor Lamb uh, is getting his butt kicked by Fetterman and deciding that what he needs to do is uh, start calling him a socialist um, who can't win uh, an election against uh, Dr. Oz even though Fetterman polls better against Dr. Oz than Connor Lamb does. So that, we talked about that. We also got deep into this, um, well, we talked about it yesterday on the Majority Report, but the uh, Google Fiber union busting story. Oh, yeah. Um, and also this Applebee's email where a manager sent an email to the, uh, the rest of the managers at a company that owns 40 Applebee's and says, hey, high gas prices actually aren't so bad for us because that's going to increase the application flow. Uh, which means um, workers are going to be deprived into needing to go back to uh, work for Applebee's. And uh, he got fired because of that, but only because he put it in writing. Like, if you look at the response to the email, a lot of people are like, this is wisdom. Great job, sir. Um, <laughs> and then it got leaked out and became a liability. But David Griscom explained why it's actually just uh, all explained uh, by Karl Marx already. Uh, and that guy was just basically stumbling onto what Karl Marx found, but he was doing it for his job at Applebee's to uh, uh, compel workers. So anyway... Patreon.com says left reckoning to get all of that, folks. All right. Well, uh, we will get Binder and uh, Brandon in the fun half. But of course, check out Doomed. Check out uh, Scam Economy. Right? They're not here, right? Nope. The discourse. No, okay. And the discourse. Do it. See you in the fun half. 646-257-3920. We'll be taking your calls. Boom. Bye. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now, but I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. The majority Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. On Matt! Fun hack. What is up, everyone? Fun hack. No me key. You did it! Fun hack. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun hack. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint you. Everyone, I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women's... Stop talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But, but dude, uh, you want to smoke this... Uh, Yes. Yes. Is this me? Is it me? It is you. Is this me? Hello, is this me? I think it is you. Who is you? 
No sound. Every single freaking day. What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism. Oh, I'm going to go start off. Who libertarians? They're so stupid, though. Common sense says, of course. Gobbledygook. We fucking did. So, what's 79 plus 21? Challenge man. I'm positively quivering. I believe 96, I want to say. 857 210 35 501 1 half. 38 9 11, for instance. $3,400, $1,900, 543 trillion dollars sold. It's a zero sum game. Actually, you're making me think less. But, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> you call it satire. Sam goes to satire. <laughs> On top of it all? Yeah. My favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, yeah. like everything you do. Without a doubt. Hey, buddy, we see you. <laughs> all right, folks, folks, folks. It's just the week being weeded out, obviously. Yeah, sun's out, guns out. I, I, I don't know. But you should know. People just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. I have a question. Who cares? Our chat is enabled, wow. folks. I love it. I do love that. Look, gotta jump. You gotta be quick. I gotta jump. I'm losing it, bro. Two o'clock. We're already late, and the guy's being a dick. So screw him. Um, um, Sent to a gulag? Outrageous. Like, what is wrong with you? Love you, bye. Love you. Bye-bye. Hello? We are back. We still do not have Brandon. So look, we have a grinning Bradley and a stoic Matt and Matt Binder. Hello, oh, Matt just Binder. yeah, I'm just an afterthought, I guess. Oh yeah, Matt Binder's here too. Yeah, okay. I oh, just said hello nice. to you. Hi, Matt Binder. <laughs> What's happening in the it Matt w- Binder universe? Well, well, first let me nice. say, first let me say, it was it was very nice seeing all you guys on Saturday. Yes. Um, always a pleasure. But I also want to say it was very nice finally meeting you, Emma. I feel like I was. I gotta say, uh, everyone was wearing their mask in the back. Uh, I walk in. I'm the last person on the show to walk in because, you know, got to be fashion yeah. late. And uh, you come over and give me a hug. And my first thought, because I couldn't see your face and your hair was different, was who the hell is hugging me? Who is this? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I didn't know at first. It wasn't until after the hug that I take a step back and see who you were. I was like, oh, it's Emma. Oh, my God. Yes, so it was very nice. Hug. We, yeah. we, uh, we need to. Un- okay. So. Um, Sam's sister took a bunch of photos, I thought, um, of us all, but I, I, Sam, I, she said to me that Sam has all the photos of us. Oh, on and Sam's phone. He's on the one Sam's who, phone. right. I thought his it was phone, phone. His phone what? definitely has the, uh, his phone definitely has the big group photo, which is the one I definitely want. Where yeah, literally insisting to me saying Julie has them, Julie has them. I'm like, you know, honestly, I think Sam has them and maybe he just doesn't want to release them. These are mine. Yeah. I can't believe them. Can't believe I, them. I mean, I want to post on my Instagram, which I never use. I want to post them too. Got to see a bunch of people who I haven't seen in forever and got to see a bunch of people who I have never met before, period. Such as yourself, Emma. Yes, I know. It was crazy. It was a really good time. Um, thank you guys if for coming out to the live show. I feel like it breathes uh, new energy into everybody. So I had a great time. Yeah, I don't so know about same, you. Same. Yeah. Now, even though, now um, sorry. No, I was going to say now back to me. Uh, so tonight, <laughs> tonight on uh, Scam Economy, a little bit early today, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time, because I got a little bit of a longer interview for you guys. Uh, I have Ed Zitron on the show. Uh, we are talking about the Axie Infinity hack and really play to earn crypto games as a whole. It is a truly dystopian uh, thing that's being pushed in the crypto world and a lot of VCs. Uh, believe this is like the the main product that will come from this whole Web3 crypto garbage. This is what they want to push. They want to push people paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars to play video games on their computer and then constantly having to keep funding it and putting more money in because they get to earn a little bit of money too. So it becomes a thing 
where, oh, you know, gaming is just another, you know, another day at work. It's not fun anymore. It's your job. Mm. Um, so that's this, tonight's episode of Scam Economy, 8.30 on YouTube. It'll probably go up a little bit earlier on a podcast at scameconomy.com. And then on Tuesday for Doomed, I had a fantastic interview with a, a journalist who um, had this investigation where he looked into these major Facebook freedom convoy groups that, you know, gained hundreds of thousands of conservative followers during the height of that whole freedom convoy movement. And it turned out that, uh, A, they were all being run by Bangladeshi internet marketers whose sole purpose for running these groups were to sell T-shirts to conservatives in America. And uh, B, there was a tech company who was literally like telling them what to do to fool conservatives into buying this stuff and joining their <laughs> Facebook groups. It's a very interesting interview. Definitely check that out. Doomedcast.com, scameconomy.com. Both shows are available at youtube.com slash mapinder. And Brandon is here wearing Kowalski's T-shirt. Look at that. Kowalski that's, finally got it to him. That's right. That's right. Uh, Bradley got it to me. I didn't have to fight him for it, luckily. Uh, he just handed it to me. No violence occurred. Um, and <gasps> we will be... Oh, wow. Wow. I should have brought mine into the office. Yeah, I, I forgot yeah. to wear it, but yeah. I don't usually wear this color, as you the can tell. The back's my favorite part. Oh, yeah. The back's great. I told them the back should be the front. That's what I said too, but no, I, I no, still no, like no. It regardless. No, business yeah, in the front, party in the back. More. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, wonderful. Nice. All right. Yeah, I'm well, going to squash uh, it today. What's happening over on the discourse, Brandon? We are back this week slash today with an episode about Ukraine and the Ukraine uh, invasion, or rather Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So, you know, uh, my co-host John has a very, you know, this is a very special topic for him. So we're, I'm glad to have, you know, a very deep, nuanced conversation about that finally. Uh, so yeah, look forward to that by tonight. Awesome. All right, everybody check that out. Now, let's just get into clips, shall we? I have one that I'm ready to get to. Which is? Which is, oh, right. Sorry, we, uh, uh, the <laughs> Charlie Kirk uh, talking about gay people one. Do you know which one? There are two Charlie Kirk clips. Is it the Disney one or the confronting? Disney. Okay, gotcha. Um, all right, let's do it. Oh, they, so, are, they are obsessed. It is. They are obsessed. obsessed. Really, I mean, obsessed. So Charlie Kirk uh, has a reaction to the recent controversy about being uh, people of the, the same gender kissing in Disney movies. Now, I don't even know what movie uh, he's referring to here because all I saw was people losing their minds over like uh, two men hugging in the background of a Star Wars movie uh, because Disney does not have the gumption to do anything about it. But um, maybe he'll explain here. Um, so the, the new thing that conservatives are, are, are doing here... Wait, is this the same... Um, Oh, yeah, this is the video. The, the new thing that conservatives are doing here is that they started with an, uh, laying the groundwork with this increase in anti-trans bigotry, which they perceive as a more digestible form of bigotry right now. It's more socially acceptable uh, because it's newer to some people's minds. And that has provided an opportunity for conservative hosts like Charlie Kirk to uh, revive uh, their anti-gay agenda, uh, which they kind of kept dormant for a little while after the Supreme Court made it the law of the land. But now they see an opening with this new Supreme Court. So the media personalities are making sure that the public is primed to hate gay people uh, to the degree that they want them to. So uh, and and I, I really think this kind of started, if you guys remember, a few months back when Buttigieg uh adopted those kids and there was a ton of weird uh, of just homophobic attacks and you saw like this increased ramp up of let's let let's start let's try this again uh part two of our assault on gay people um so here is charlie kirk with his commentary being one of those conservative commentators talking about same-sex kissing scenes in disney movies um here he is it's, I know I keep resorting back to it, but Christopher Caldwell really depicted the danger of having out-of-control liberation movements that are not anchored 
in legitimate grievance. Christopher Caldwell in the book Age of Entitlement warned us that the trajectory that we are on is the very groups that allegedly want liberation will soon become the tyrants themselves. In fact, it will happen almost immediately, almost overnight. That once the groups are formed, it's not like all of a sudden the ACLU and the LGBT groups like disassemble, like, oh, we got gay marriage done. Now we can just put our paperwork away. No, it's an entire cottage industry of outrage and hysteria. It gave them meaning and purpose. And so now it's just, that's not about making gay marriage legal. It's legal in every single state. And that was always their big fight. No, no, now it's about making your kids gay. Why else, no, why else would you want to have two dudes or two women kissing in a Disney film? What is the agenda? To expose them to it or to increase the ranks of the LGBTQ community? What the is ranks. the process? People were gay before this sort of nonsense was happening. So why exactly are you doing this? They're like, well, we want to have four-year-olds that have you know, homosexual attractions to know that they're not alone when they're watching yes. movies. Like, really? A yeah. four-year-old? Yeah. Really? Like, four-year-olds are eating dirt. Like, I don't think they're exactly making very <sighs> deep arguments about what they're sexually attracted to. How? Um, you know, they, I was uh, let's, let's, Yeah. Wait, what go, were you going to say, Matt? I, I, well, I, yeah, Matt, go Binder, ahead. You go ahead first. I was going to say, the, these people really hate kids. Like, you the, you think, like, they, they bring up, like, oh, there's... They don't uh, respect you know, them at all. They, they don't respect they their... They look down on them. A, yeah. a four-year-old is not... I have a two-year-old. She is smart as a whip. She's super smart. She watches the uh, Disney movie. She's singing the songs after one viewing. She retains everything, understands it. If she doesn't understand it, she'll ask me question after question. Questions that I didn't even think... I don't even. I didn't even think at the age of 35 five to ask they're thinking up because you know kids are smart they're very curious and very receptive of everything um and the idea though that they're being shown but even even what charlie kirk is saying is wrong like the primary reason to like have a same-sex kiss in a uh like a, a a disney movie isn't for like kids own sexuality primarily in my opinion it's primarily because kids who are four have families like that who are same sex, two dads, two moms, and they get to see their own family reflected on TV with the characters that they grow to love and see, you know, that this is this is just normal. This is how life is. This is these are normal families. To me, that's because these guys are always thinking sex. That's the thing. They're not thinking of the family, of the you know, the family dynamic, just happy people who are not thinking of sex all the time, like these conservative perverts are. Well, they're repressed, right? And so, like, that is the constant projection that they're they're putting. Yeah, it, it does blow my mind. They don't respect kids' ability per to perceive whatsoever. They conflate, you know, uh, the concept of family with sexuality all the time or the concept of somebody's, you know, we, we played a clip the, uh, yesterday of a Republican lawmaker interrogating a 14-year-old trans girl about her genitalia. There's very little understanding of, you know, gender expression versus just the straight up sexual element because they're kind of titillated and and interested in it, but it, it freaks them out at the same time. But really, you know, what 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 strikes me here is, you know, Charlie Kirk throws away the concept that gay marriage has been legal, the law of the land, as if it's been this way for decades and decades. It's just always been this way. They've gotten their win. No, no, no. It's uh, been pretty recent and the Supreme Court is already chipping away at they've allowed multiple states to uh, violate Roe v. Wade under under their um, uh, th their allowance, essentially. They allowed for them to do so. So what's to say that the Supreme Court won't overturn precedent that's incredibly recent, such as gay marriage? And the whole reason that conservative commentators are speaking this way about this stuff is because they want that to happen and they want to create a movement for that. And so, uh, you know, then the second part of that there is him portraying gay people as groomers or showing gay love as uh, grooming kids to be just like them, perverted. When, of course, that's not the reality. What, what representation in film and things like that is there for is to, one, as you say, Bender, make kids feel like their families are represented, but two, 
have these memories if they are gay and they will know sooner rather than than later even if they're young kids um oftentimes kids have a sense of these things pretty early on that they're not uh ostracized from society yeah that's the liberal agenda here to not make kids hate themselves you really call it as charlie kirk right i mean at this point well, these guys the thing, know... you mentioned no go ahead go ahead brandon go ahead hello oh i think i'm like uh behind a little bit i'm acting a little delayed, yeah. A little delayed. Oh. yeah go ahead well, a little delay. Uh, let me just say, you know, I think the, Emma's first point about the uh, projection was, that's what struck me first, that the, his whole spiel was about how minorities, traditionally oppressed groups, once given, the, you know, any kind of inclusivity into like mainstream mass culture will inherently try to move from just being included to like oppressing the white, you know, minority now or white, like male minority now as just like a function of that's what they will do now that they're there when in reality like that's what he's complaining about like the complex victimology of the republican party that holds them all together that is that these groups will somehow rise up out of their shackles and shackle you the fact that you want to keep them in shackles is supposed to be you know just the natural way of the world because if you don't they'll just you know put you in shackles but of course he can't admit that and you know to matt's point this is about like selling people disney movies and more and more consumers have people in their families who are you know, LGBTQ, who are black, you know, I remember when, I remember when Fox was complaining about the black princess and princess and the frog. And, you know, they are afraid of not kids being made into, uh, rather kids being inducted into the gay ranks. They're afraid of kids just thinking being gay is normal. You know, they're afraid of kids just not thinking it's inherently gross or weird to be gay or to experience same sex attraction or to be trans. And that's just the bread and butter of what the Republican Party sells to people now. And so, you know, what Republicans want you to do, or want, they want to be America's like racist uncle, who everyone just puts up with in their old bigoted ideas for some reason due to affection or due to us being a society. And what they don't like now is that a lot of people our age, who millennials who grew up with a mass media culture that was more inclusive, if not more like egalitarian, monetary, I mean, uh, economically, you know, now we have kids and a lot of us who put up with our racist uncle, you know, or our anti-trans uncle or whatever we had to put up with at Thanksgiving, uh, have kids now who we're not going to expose to that same thing. And they just want to, you know, they just want to hold America hostage because to them what a society is, is that, you know, it's that family unit that they get to like, you know, terrorize every year. Right, right. You know, it's, it's interesting because they they well of course there are there are quite a few that probably do still don't like, still don't believe that you are born you know uh, gay or or lesbian or bisexual or transgender but the, the 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 most of them at least people like Charlie Kirk who have a platform they definitely know that so the idea that they think these movies are turning children gay are bullshit. They don't think that, but that actually makes it even more like nefarious because what they actually want to do is they want these kids to repress how they actually are and live a miserable life, not being yeah. able to be who they are and not being able to, you know, be in a relationship that they want to be with based on how they were born. They want they, that's like the real like like hidden evil here and they want them to suffer for the fact that they're different you know and and it's like it's punishment it we want you to be pun we want to punish you for your difference and it, it it like it's honestly uh something you can extrapolate to the larger conservative mindset they are so punitive and it doesn't have any connection to outcomes it's not going to change anybody's sexuality but it doesn't matter because they hate you and so you're going to be punished for being different yeah i mean all this stuff the um the anti-lgbt stuff the uh, anti-crt stuff is all about mind control or ideological discipline um the the and the, the thing about this disney story is it's a great example of um right-wing populism is always just a trojan horse for just um basically the priorities of bosses and bigots and how they're mutually um uh they have a mutually exclusive relationship um because this story about disney they like to present it as if they're going up against the hollywood elites but actually what's going on in disney is much uh more complicated than that whereas the elites at disney as opposed uh, which is to say the executives and particularly the new executive leadership yeah let's put this up has basically uh gone against previous leadership who was more let's let's just say woke 
uh, more open and sensitive to these sorts of issues. And now this is from um, March 9th. Disney censors same-sex affection in Pixar films, according to Letter from Employees. So what uh, what Charlie Kirk and all these conservatives are doing is actually coming to the defense of Disney bosses, but pretending like they're against these uh, these degenerate Disney elites. But what they're supporting is a effort to discipline these employees um, by Disney leadership um, who d- doesn't want, who wants to re- um, basically react against and move away from the type of representation that they were allowing in their shows. Um, and Pixar employees are tired of being censored about all this stuff, particularly yeah. in light of- They what's... walked out, right? Exactly. And what's going on in with the DeSantis stuff, right? Like, yeah. and, and so like this idea that it's conservative versus Disney, you know, it's conservatives and Disney bosses versus the people that actually do work to put those um, uh, products up on uh, movie screens. Yeah, it's hard to find like a more wholesome and probably like liberal- uh, cohort of the disney um uh, uh art that's being put out in the pixar section um, and they feel it and they feel yeah. pressure and they actually i mean they get it like they're it's a yeah. genuine like you actually have this role in society that's high profile and you see what's going on around you you want to do something good about it and you have desantis and um these sort of uh, all these folks within Disney who are basically getting all the support, even though it's this you know, re- re- uh, kayfabe, as they say in wrestling, this fake fight between Charlie Kirk and Disney as if he's not doing exactly what Disney executives want. Yeah, all let's right. let's go to another conservative commentator on this Disney thing and we can continue our conversation if uh, if you guys are down for that. Um, this is Greg Kelly here. So Greg Kelly, like Charlie Kirk, is also outraged by uh, Disney. So what's the Disney film that has the same sex uh, kiss? I I don't even know what it is. Because, Apparently, well, it's an upcoming movie, the the the, bu- the Buzz Lightyear prequel, Lightyear. Yeah, uh, because because before this, we should mention like they're going crazy, like the gay agenda is rampant in Disney movies. Two years ago, the Pixar movie that came out onward, the big. LGBTQ uh, welcoming moment in that movie was a throwaway like Z level side character, a a female identifying monster mentions her wife. Well, that I mean, is the big LGBT moment, by the way, grooming. that Disney that's snuck grooming. in. Right. I would say you know it's worth mentioning that they do stuff like that so that the characters are easier to cut out and like re- and re- edit out for like foreign markets that are even more like homophobic right. in some ways. Yes. And so like right. a lot of this overlap that Charlie Kirk and current conservatives have here are with like you know conservatives abroad who also want this stuff cut out of these movies. And yeah. to Matt's point about how bigots go hand in hand with bosses, uh, they do not want gay portrayals because then you might have to cut it, cut it out of i don't know the chinese market or i i, I don't even know if that's in china but I, that's a huge market i know for disney movies so that's why i'm using that as an example um but like other foreign markets uh because it might hurt their bottom line um so anyway uh greg kelly other conservative commentators are laundering this position for the capitalists at disney and not the creators at pixar the artists that are trying to make their work meaningful here um and here greg kelly is uh talking about the portrayal of gay people in in um in movies for kids or i think in movies in general and he likens gay people to his love of model trains I don't get this be your whole self routine at work or even in art, even in products that you are creating for other people to consume. For instance, take me. I love model trains. Did you know that? I actually do. Uh, These guys, uh, they've got a great train set. I've admired it. Pause it. All right. So uh, here Greg Kelly is uh, talking about how, just leave that up for a second. Um, Greg (laughs) Kelly's talking about how you should never, uh, how you don't need to put uh, certain parts of yourself in your profession as he talks about uh, his love for model trains at his profession. And I love this picture. Yeah, I mean, Greg Kelly, the guy, just a bizarre man. Like, his, if you just search Greg Kelly tweets, you'll just see a whole bunch of just bizarre things that he's just divulged uh, voluntarily. So, like, yeah, I'm the guy to be giving this advice. I want to say that. The- I'm not a big Greg Kelly viewer, but I feel like I can say confidently that if his show was entirely about model trains, it'd probably be a better show, you know, both like socially better. And, you know, I might even watch it. I might learn something. I think that in an ideal world, he should have a, yeah, you know, in an ideal world, in a socialist future, he'd be able to have a show about model trains. Yeah, is Greg Kelly 
advocate for more public transit and uh, publicly funded public transit as well. Uh, then we're all for it. If he's into trains, let's go. A three-day work week, you got like two days you can just set aside for trains. I mean, now we're well, talking. All right, continue. Love trains. I love them. I don't talk about it on TV because it's a pretty niche hobby and not a lot of people are into it, all right? Especially at my age. That's my thing. I'll do it. On hold on, hold show. on. Pause it, pause it, pause it. Yeah. The people who are into model trains are like all his age and older. What is this guy talking about? Also, that's, that's the stereotype. Yeah, they're, they're also allowed to get married to other uh, model train enthusiasts. Yep. Um, they're also like not beaten up as far as I know. There's not a, like a, a endemic of violence against um, model train enthusiasts. Um, so I'm not, I'm not quite seeing the analogy here, but. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. But keep going. Well, the airplane did rain havoc on the model train community, I'm sure. But other than that, <laughs> not going to bother you about it. Fair? You get it? I think that's a pretty good analogy. I don't. Then there's this. The showrunners were super welcoming. Meredith Roberts and like the, the our leadership over there has been so welcoming to like my like not at all secret gay agenda. I don't have to be afraid to like. Let's have these two characters kiss. Let's in the background. This like I was just wherever I could, just basically adding queerness to like. The, if you see anything queer in the show, I'm proud of them. But like I, I just was like, no one would stop me, and no one was trying to stop me. Just have fun with your not so secret gay agenda and queerness, and uh, putting it in movies and cartoons. And uh, where has it been so far? I watched this stuff from time to time, I guess, over the years. These are movies you've heard of, I've heard of. Uh, is this what they've been up to? I'll just name them. Uh, Remember the Titans, Cool Runnings, The Mighty Ducks, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins which... <laughs> Some real bangers Which one there. of these does not bangers. belong? I mean, damn. We had to go deep for Mary Poppins. I mean, I those cool first four are around the same time period in terms of the yeah. release, right? But, like, what is his point about these five movies? Hold on. He should have put up Song of the South. <laughs> 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 Or like the one where Donald Duck goes to like Mexico or something and like he hangs out with a mariachi band made up of parrots. Like, you know, yeah. like the classics. Or any Speedy Gonzalez. Hold yeah. on, what is his point though on these on these movies? Like I'm dying to hear. They don't promote the gay agenda. Okay. These are movies you've heard of, I've heard of. Uh, is this what they've been up to all along? Is this what they will be up to from <laughs> now on? Um, I don't think it's going to. See, that's the thing with Greg Kelly is I like his he doesn't seem genuine. He seems to be performing this. I know, but like, I need to hold on. So that's the point. He's just listing Disney well, or di okay. Keep I mean, going. That one went with Dalmatians. I mean, she might be doing a gay agenda there. I don't know. I can't All right. It. To help the newsies. Line. Hold on. Newsies. You know, movies are... <laughs> I've never heard of come that. Come on. Come on. Look at the cover of that. Come on. <laughs> Flubber is a is Flubber is actually a very, very pro bisexual movie. If you've watched it. <laughs> <laughs> with a, with cl a close viewing of Flubber will tell you that. About people, why do they have to be about LGBTQ people or anything like, is the orientation really all that? Hey, the thing is, is like, it's not even about- Is that it? That's it. What? None of these movies are about that. It, she, even in the, the like supposed gay agenda quote, which he was obviously using that, those phrase for like the impact that it has, like, like ironically basically she's talking about in the background it's not like we need to do a pixar movie like about uh like gay people in their 20s like doing raunchy stuff or something like nobody is saying that they're just saying we need to not omit this like as a policy yeah as if this doesn't exist in real life like a man another man hugging or a woman another woman having a like being formally together like like that sort of stuff that's that's the gay agenda that they're the entire right, the entire right right now is freaking out about. Yeah, and like I, you know what? I, Greg Kelly's a step away from. Did you guys ever see those uh, pictures of the hidden penises in like The Lion King and Aladdin and stuff on yep. the mm. on Little the, Mermaid? I mean, yep. I, they've been they've been promoting the gay agenda all along, even in The Little Mermaid, even in Aladdin, even in The Lion King, uh, or what it was the the the, the like cloud spelled. Or well, no, like that. You know, it, it Someone... either says sex or SFX or oh, sound effects. Sex, <laughs> right. <laughs> Someone should show him Kingdom Hearts. Someone should like play like play him like a let's play of the Kingdom Hearts series and like really blow his mind. <laughs> well, what, what, one thing I always think about though when I see Greg Kelly is that people have to remember he is the son of former NYPD police chief 
Ray Kelly. And, you know, where do you think Greg Kelly got this stuff from? Uh, you know, Greg Kelly's on TV, on Newsmax, uh, that, you know, spreading this shit. But, you know, his position on a news network that not many people watch isn't the same as his dad, who formerly ran one of the world's biggest armies and no doubt instilled these things. And I'm sure, uh, you know, you see in the NYPD to today, I'm sure. And he hasn't been the chief for quite some time. Yeah, what, when was his tenure? Um, Ray the Bloomberg Kelly? years, and I think I think uh, when uh, when um, what's his face when um, De Blasio got elected, I think serving... he let him go. Yeah, so he was in office. Um, I guess it says he was the longest serving commissioner in the history of of the NYPD. Was he the one who invented a broken windows policing? Was that is that Ray Kelly, or am I thinking of someone else? Uh, um, it yeah, might have been the know. guy before him. Yeah, I don't know if he invented it, but he sure implemented Mainstream it. Mainstream, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's take a few calls, shall we? Calling from a three o four number. Who's this? Where are you calling from? One sec. Uh, hey, can you hear me? Three o four. Can you hear me? Three o four. Uh, going once. Can you hear me? Oh, three o four. Can you? Gotcha. Yep. We got gotcha. you. Yeah. All right, fantastic. Uh, one sec, let me just get to a place that's a little bit outside of work. Okay. Um, I was going to call and talk to you guys about the intersection between like trans rights and crypto. Yeah, and can you, can you, uh, who is this? Where are you calling from though? Oh, this is Ren calling from Southern Oregon. Oh, Ren, how are you? Good to talk to you. I've, I've actually been doing all right. Doing all right. Um, yeah, I was going to say that we've had some good news. There's been House Bill 17 that is looking like it is going to get passed in Alaska, and basically it updates its anti-discrimination legislation to add stuff with um, gay and trans people. So that's freaking fantastic. That's There's great. still, you know, obviously a lot of the terrifying legislation in states like Alabama, Tennessee, and Texas. But yeah, that's some good news. That's great. All right. Well, is are you just uh, calling to give us some good news? Uh, no, I was going to talk to you and. Uh, a little area where we disagree on cryptocurrencies. <laughs> okay. Um, so okay. <laughs> I was going to like I, I've heard you guys continually say I want you to guys I wish you guys to give me one instance where like crypto helps disenfranchise people and different stuff. And I was going to point out that there is actually I, I know people who have done this who either as kids or as adults have used cryptocurrency. Uh, to be able to purchase HRT from gray market vendors online, like this woman, Lena, in Ukraine, who sells estradiol valerate in places in Brazil. And it's not just like, you know, people who are minors, it's people in other countries like India, Pakistan, places where there's like really, really awful oppression towards people in these communities, where they're able to get access to what for them is life-saving medical care. And to be honest, I hope the crypto market crashes. I hope it dives into the ground and Bitcoin is a penny stock. But I don't care if it's worth $10,000 or one ten thousandth of a dollar for a Bitcoin. All that matters is that it is for the sake of day-to-day -day interactions in anonymized currency. Yeah, I mean, I understand in terms of using it to, to buy things like that that might not be available here. I, I I'm fine. I, I that as its original usage, it's not a terrible concept. Uh, but right, like, but the answer yeah. isn't that that should be the thing. Like the answer shouldn't be that people have to go to these gray markets to buy this stuff with this illicit money. Like the answer should yeah. be that these things should be available to people. Oh, they couldn't hear. Uh, they couldn't hear Bender there. Sorry, we're we're working with the board. Now you should be able to. But yeah, do you want to say that one more time, Bender? Oh, yeah, I was going to say, you know, the, the answer, though, isn't that, you know, we, we promote Bitcoin or any crypto usage for this type of uh, use case. The answer is that we make this life saving or life changing medication available to people legally and we make it available to them uh, so they don't have to do what, you know, they don't have to go through illicit markets where who knows how legit even the medications they're getting are. I mean, that, that's, you know, yeah. it's a current workaround, but I would never promote that as like, right. that's why it's needed. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was just yeah, going to say that's course, a... It's a transitory thing, but for the time being, it's very useful. And I don't think it's helpful to like give that up right now. You know, it's like there are a lot of people saying that you should just, you know, ban this entirely. And I think that like, you know, we're going to need it in a lot of places in the world. 
and in a lot of people in bad circumstances for the next 20, 30 years. I think I'm oh. less sold on that. Um, but I do think like that's a good example of like how these are like it's sort of like how we say like you can actually you can make money by speculating on this stuff too, yeah. right? Like we, we don't deny like Yeah, the, yeah, it, of course. I think that's awful and I think the impact of that has been bad. I think that right. cryptocurrency overall as like impacts on wealth inequality has been a net negative and it's hurt a lot of people who have lost their ass on this stuff. Um, who have gotten into these like scam coins that end up getting rug pulled by these content creators. Um, but I think that there are a handful of like positive edge outcomes because of it. I also was going to say, I, I personally wouldn't do this as a musician because, you know, like the amount of carbon to like mint an NFT is about the same as taking a flight across the country, but you can do really interesting stuff with NFTs of like, let's say you record a different take of each track and you assign each one to be its own, you know, individual marker, that could be a really neat little concept with that. There are cool ideas to do with the technology, but overall it's not being used in a good way right now. Yeah. I mean, I, I think like even in like things like remittances, like there's, there's cases where an individual might be able to get advantage on that. And, and the instance you're to, uh, mentioning is an important one, but the problem is like that's not going to scale up, um, and I don't know that we can make policy based around like uh, those limited edge cases. Frankly, like I, I think the the wider um, problem of cryptocurrency is outweighs that. Um, but uh, and, and that's because I don't think it's it's going to be a sustainable place for people to like source stuff like that for twenty to thirty years. I just I I'm skeptical of that. But Brandon, you were going to say something. Oh, oh, yeah. oh go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, you, you go ahead first. Uh, I was going to say, like, people have been using this for, like, about a decade. It's not at all reliant on the currency, like, having any value. It could be worth, like, fractions of a penny. But the point is that, like, it's the intermediary currency. Gotcha. All right. Well, I, I appreciate I, you all, Ren, um, here. Uh, Brandon, can, you can respond uh, when you when uh, I hang up on you, because then we'll take another call after yeah. that. Thanks One so much. Thing. I just, oh, okay. Bye. <laughs> oh, wait. No, you can go. Last thing. Oh, I was, I was going to say that, like, call me, like, a social libertarian, call me an anarchist, call me a libertarian socialist, whatever you want to. But, you know, like, I, I, don't, I don't think we have to agree on everything to say that we are mostly aligned with each other politically. Agreed. You know? Appreciate it. Have a good one. Yeah. Take care. I, yeah. Go take on, care. Friend. Oh, no, take care, uh, caller. And also, you know, I would agree with that. I, I would just say, you know, we have to be careful about, like the caller mentioned, using edge cases that people are using, you know, people, oppressed people are using or able to utilize to survive and turning that into, uh, you know, a justification for an entirely corrupt system, you know. Because at the end of the day, what we're talking about, you know, we don't have any numbers in front of us to say how many trans people are using this to get, you know, uh, life-saving medication. But what we do know is that even if that is the case, that we can't in good conscience advise people who need life-saving medication to get involved with crypto because for every one or two person who, get, who gets rich, uh, people lose money in rug pulls. There yes. are rug pulls every other day. They just lost $625 million worth of Ethereum and USD coin on uh, an Axie Infinity scam. So, you know, at a certain point, it becomes like, yes, you know, when we see it sometimes in our society, too, people using like edge cases within a system to justify like the entirety of that system as needing to exist because it has liberatory potential. But in this is even, you know, an even more uh, difficult case to use for that for because like, yeah, but if someone tries to do this with that uh, technology, they could even lose what little money they have. You know, people like get loans out to, you know, try to double it in crypto and lose all that money. And that's something that we can't really advocate for just because like some people have gotten lucky within that system, generally speaking. Right. right. To add a little bit more to that, actually, I'll be talking about it tonight on Scam Economy. That's what the episode's about, the Axie Infinity uh, hack. Um, nice. 35% 30, of the Axie Infinity users are based in the Philippines where the money they earn from playing Axie Infinity is actually, it's not like, it's not like minimum wage there, but it's enough to keep them, you know, they make like something like $150 a month or something like that, which is a job for them over there. Um, because of this hack, they can't cash, cash out. So they're, they, they basically lost their jobs and have no way to make an income right now for the 35% of Axie Infinity users based in the Philippines who are using this as their main source of income. Like that's how quickly it all just disappears.
Yeah, you know, I think yeah. as a you know as a leftist, what I'm advocating for is better infrastructure, including healthcare and access to, uh, like the necessary resources for treatment. You know, of all sorts of uh, medical conditions, not just like you know uh, HRT, but like diabetes, et cetera. And you know, the like trying to like, justify like what's like a gambling economy because some gamblers are able to use the money they win from gambling to pay for that stuff is just like it's you know it's just not safe to put your money into crypto. So it's like yeah. it's hard to like justify it's yeah. like a liberatory structure. Yeah, and like to Ren's to Ren's uh, credit, like that is an example, but it's one that is better, like I think, emphasized um, person to person for somebody who actually yes, needs an avenue as like that, to, as like, opposed to as opposed to like publicizing it as an avenue for like wire liberation, extrapolating it onto a system, as as you guys yeah. have been saying. Yeah, I know. I think. Yeah. Okay. I was just say no, one last okay. point. I think that's a that's a good point because like we do hear that a lot online, where people who like need to utilize systems that we understand are you know exploitative like people who like are disabled and can't like you know can't afford to like not order groceries because obviously that's necessary and so like grocery apps are exploitative of workers but you know there's a middle ground between needing to rely on exploitative systems and you know i hate to say it taking personal offense to the fact that people point out those systems are exploitative because you need to rely on them by nature of the way our society works and therefore becoming a voice to justify the existence of those systems when people are you know ultimately arguing for better you know better treatment of people who need these resources around yeah right i mean it's necessary in those individual cases but not sufficient for a society and like it's it's just it's you got we you can talk about structural changes while also exploiting like the the fault lines in our messed up society in order to survive like that's do that in terms of like jobs you have to get whatever you need to do you can make those own determinations based on your individual context uh, I'm going to read some IMs and then we'll get to some more clips. Manasai, love the girl power on the show today. Thursdays are my favorite days. Love the Emma Jordy report. Thank you. Yes. Um, Talia from Tampa. Hey, Emma, hope you and the crew are doing well. All this stuff targeting trans folks has really been hurting me. I didn't know I was trans when I was in grade school, but I don't think I'd be have been as brave as many of these kids are. You should look into the women, uh, the woman who is a catalyst for some of these laws in Florida and how psychotic her story is. Love what you do. Thank you for being extra brave for me and other trans people during this time. It's pretty clear we need all the help we can get. Oh, that's very sweet. Um, and then you followed up and says, January Little John. We should look into that. Her story is psychotic. She's suing the local school because her kid didn't feel comfortable coming out to her, but was being affirmed properly at school without the school outing her child to her. Wow. I'm going to write that down. Uh, January Little John, that's her name. It sounds fake, but... Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but she ain't. Oh, gosh. Wait, what'd you say? You did a little, little I went, yeah. Oh. Hey. <laughs> uh, Judy Rulliani, Weinstein is doing okay. a <laughs> You want to keep it up? Yeah. Got, yeah. It's been a while since Ben's family we'll get his little John impression. Oh, off. yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you got one more. I'm good. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> nightmares <laughs> Bradley has some more nightmares uh seven day rotation Lee High professor guest Lafayette alum host uh then discussing Pennsylvania's third district what a Pennsylvania centric show if <laughs> it's true if only you were discussing PA 7th it would be a Lehigh Valley centric show nope not there um I, I I don't have like a ton of warm feelings about the college I went to so that's just like a lot of stupid white rich kids. Um. Anyway, Ryan in Los Angeles, the same uh people fell for the ivermectin grift. The same reason people fell for the ivermectin grift is why they swallowed Q. Supposed insiders releasing secret knowledge has a strong appeal to people who have no power over their lives. Well said. You said that more succinctly than I did when we were discussing that clip. Uh, I I, I think it's true. Oh well, yeah, no, I mean, also it, it's funny like that it was sort of this anti-pharma thing, but really it's like American sort of capitalist uh, logic that you just need to find the right consumer product and you're actually um, protected from all of this. And I know it right now. Just subscribe to my Substack. <laughs> the bestest leftist for Emma Jordy Thursday. I'd like to say that Emma, that I followed you a little at TYT when I found out you were hired on MR. I have to say I didn't think it was a good move. Oh. Okay. Uh, I didn't think you had the age and experience for the role. However, I definitely probably don't, but I'm, I'm learning. 
However, I couldn't have uh, been more wrong. You have shocked me with your knowledge and understanding of the political discourse of this country. I'm 44 and didn't even get political until I was 30. Most of the people I know in my life have very little political knowledge. Any uh, one who ever said you didn't deserve this position is flat out wrong. Did someone say that? Congratulations well, I mean, the on your arrival. Thank the you, Bestest did. Leftist. Sorry, what'd you say? Um, I said uh, the messenger Brandon. did. The messenger uh, said it, but yeah, right. besides them, <laughs> I've never heard it. <laughs> That was you, yeah. Uh, but it's still sweet. It's like that Chris James joke. He calls up like Gorka or whatever, and he's like, "Yeah, I love you. I listen to you every day. Um, I my my sister hates you though. She says you're a big idiot with a giant head." And, <laughs> and I always tell her like I don't agree with any of that, and he says you lie about everything. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Can we do the Gorka clip? Uh, yes. I'll read one more. Oh, I am unless Walker you Gorka clip. Nice. Hey, MR crew, heard you guys talking about the right wing quack going on and on about the litter boxes. Just wanted to bring to your attention there are several schools in my area, one of which directly in my community. I have family on the school school board, and uh, there are people asking for these litter boxes to be installed. I live in a rural area. The notion was laughed out of the room. I know this isn't important. Don't mean to bring attention to it. What they're trying to do is undercut trans rights by focusing on it. So you're just saying it's like fake. Um, but I heard you guys laughing at it like it was completely fat. Oh, you're like it was completely fabricated. Unfortunately, at least in nor northern Indiana, it's not, says Lefty Sparky. Okay. I'd have to see that confirmed. Um All right, let's uh yeah, exactly. Let's do this Gorka clip thing. What number is this? Number eight. So Sebastian Gorka is at it again. Oh, there he is with Breitbart editor in chief Alex Marlowe talking about the way that the left has criticized uh, Clarence Thomas for not recusing himself on a case that these uh, text messages seem to indicate directly uh, involved his own wife, right wing activist Ginny Thomas. Here's their take on. Uh, on, on, on what the left's uh, response constitutes, and it's offensive. I remember a time, Alex, when Democrats lynched black uh, Americans because uh, they had relations with white women. This is just a newer version of that, isn't it? It's wow. certainly in the same ballpark because acting like it's something new that Ginny Thomas is part of the conservative movement is is it's, it's just incredibly dishonest. Anyone who's been in the conservative movement for five minutes, Dr. G, and I've been, it, been in it for 15 years, uh, knows Ginny Thomas is a major player in the conservative movement. Uh, and not, 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 only that, not only that, has been friends with Mark Meadows for decades, and the fact that she's not allowed to text Mark Meadows, the president's chief of staff, on January yeah. the 6th, that, Such that's straw a men. reason that her husband can't be a Supreme Court justice, Alex? It's incredibly belittling to all women because in this instance, you have a woman who actually independently is successful in her uh, preferred vocation, which is conservative activism. She's pretty legendary in the space. I wonder how hard it is it, to be successful in conservative activism when your husband is on the fucking Supreme Court as one of the reactionaries there. Yeah, right. that might give her a leg up. Also, I like the the his his you know his explanation as to why this is different is that in this specific situation the woman is in this position. There's never been a woman before, uh, Ginny Thomas, who uh, was in this position where she was known for something she did. This is a first, folks. Yeah. Also, can I just say like, what's this guy's name? Alex Harlow. Marlo. Uh, uh, Marlo. Marlo. Like. He looks like a character with, uh, a witness for Brock Turner. Um, so oh, my that, God. I'm glad, good he, one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that he uh, uh, specified that he's been in this business for 15 years, because otherwise I would think he's just some shithead at Stanford. But anyway. We'll, and uh, I just but hold, quickly, I just before we get to the rest of the clip, I just want to point out that their entire argument pro Ginny Thomas is rested on a straw man, that the left is upset. That they with, texted. Right. That they texted and that they're buddies and that she's in conservative activism. Like, no, that's not the issue i mean i think she's a freak well, i don't like i don't get it i mean I, I i think her and her husband are a match made in hell and and like really psychos both of them but I, the reason it wasn't brought up before by the left to this extent was because there wasn't a case that was involving her in front of the supreme court that justice thomas 
refuse to recuse himself from and like he's been doing this for many decades but this is just such a bra brazen example of it and it was it came to light due to the january 6th committee documents but also i have to point out how hog Golka just goes right into it right into right into the lynching thing just like dude if you're i know you're plagiarizing clarence thomas in a clarence thomas story um but at least maybe make it a little more subtle than just using his exact uh phrasing when he tried to defend himself from the accusations of sexual misconduct it's interesting the way they like they protect the big lie too like this the, it's rather than saying because the, the what's underneath all this is that the conservative movement is full of absolute horseshit about like voter fraud and stuff like that and Jeannie thomas believes it and wants uh to use her position as like this person in sconce in the conservative movement to get action on that from official members of the government right um and I mean, but that's just the conservative movement now doing coups or attempted coups or notional coups that Trump wants, but no one wants to give him because they already got the Supreme Court picks from him. Like that is just part of the conservative movement now. I just think Tom it's disgusting that Democrats, I'm just going to say, I just think it's disgusting that Democrats want to lynch white women for dating black men now. <laughs> you know, all, uh, Dr. G is really looking out. <laughs> on January yeah. the 6th, that's, that's a reason that her husband can't be a Supreme Court justice, Alex? It's incredibly belittling to all women. Oh, thank you for supporting me. Instance, you have a woman who actually independently is successful in, this instance. in her uh, a preferred vocation, which is conservative activism. She's pretty legendary in the space. And to act as though that it, it compromises Clarence Thomas's legal judgment it is evidence free. And it's an attack on, on Ginny Thomas's character uh, and Clarence Thomas's character, all from an unfounded place. Yeah, it's it totally seems. absurd. It's designed for us to take our eye off the ball with all the problems in Joe Biden's America. I think your audience, my audience, Dr. G, I think we see through that uh, pretty easily. But just know what this represents for the rest of us, those of us who have a controversial job, even if our spouse doesn't agree with us politically, you could get lynched in the high tech style yeah. so long as it's convenient for them politically now. I lynched in the high tech style. Canceling. Guys, come up with your own fucking ideas. Stop using the exact same phrase that Clarence Thomas used in his in his hearings when he, you know, uh, like was defending himself against incredibly uh, credible and obvious sexual misconduct allegations like they're just they're, they're just using his terms and they're not even bothering to hide it it blows my mind but no 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 canceling cancel culture is the 21st century's this modern day lynching it, it's it's just, just let that wash over you <laughs> oh my god uh support and support anita hill that's all i gotta say we still have normal lynchings in this country, which is crazy. Yeah, you know, and like, well, I feel like they're like, and this is all because they're also anti the new anti lynching, right. uh, yes. you know, the new anti lynching laws, which probably don't even go far enough. But you know, that's why lynching is on their minds. Yeah, if, they don't go far enough, and also about a century and a half too late. <laughs> um, right. And uh, amazing that, like, I mean, it really is an indictment on America that we went through the entire like just. 20th century to name one uh without any sort of movement on that front um or well movement on it that was immediately squashed by the uh, government right I, I didn't mean to cut you off there brandon but uh we're on a bit of a delay i actually was uh because it reminded me we have another clip about that very lynching legislation that we should get to for sure oh Ooh. yeah so go to nine um let's see if i can get my sound sheet ben shapiro he thinks that lynching is a historic relic, and so the uh, Steve King defender Ben Shapiro. Yeah, right, right. Um, was not that concerned about anti-Semitism in that case. Interesting. White supremacist uh, lover Steve King. Yes, uh, Ben Shapiro was his supporter. Yeah, he says that lynching is not an issue in the United States. Conveniently forgetting what happened with Ahmaud Arbery very recently, that those convictions just happened. Um, and so he, he believes that legislation on this front uh, is basically performative. Here he is downplaying the horrors of lynching. Um, it's, it's happening all the time, really. It's, it's not a relic of the past. I'm going to read you. 
the statistics on lynching in the United States. You ready? Here's some actual statistics compiled by the University of Kentucky. Okay, here we go. Here are the lynchings by year and race. 1882, 64 white people were lynched, 49 black people were lynched. I mean, one of the great untold stories about lynching, of course, is that there is racist lynching, and there's a lot of non-racist lynching as well, right? There were <laughs> white people who were lynching other white people for various crimes. Uh, often for, like, being communists and stuff like that. There are a lot of black-on-white hate crimes is what Ben Shapiro wants to, you know, tell you guys about. <laughs> so, 1886. Or in 1885, for example, 110 white people were lynched, 74 black people were lynched. Okay, but in 1898, at 101 black people were lynched, 19 white people lynched. And and these numbers are they're horrifying, obviously. I mean, these are obviously. evil, evil crimes, what we are talking about right here. Grand total. I'm just gonna give you the total because at a certain point, basically once you get past maybe 1909, pretty much everybody who's getting lynched is black. So that's it. Okay, so he's essentially, um, he says it's a relic of the past. It never happens again. I, I, I cited that example. Um, you can categorize uh, a lot of the um, murders of black people by police as uh, a form of lynching as well. Although, you know, it's maybe not meets, doesn't meet his exact specific uh, legal definition there. But, like, why even raise this? If you feel it's a relic of the past and the Senate decides that they want to, I think it's in the Senate right now, right? The anti lynching legislation. Whatever. If Biden wants to sign it, um, did they already sign it? God, my. The Biden yeah, signed sorry. it. Yeah, sorry. My, my mind is like completely all over the place with time. Biden signed this legislation. Uh, then, then, then why care? If it's not really an issue, then fine. You can use that piece of legislation as an ornament. It doesn't really necessarily matter. But for him, he wants to use this as an opportunity to say, well, look at the left trying to uh, drum up relics of the past, racial resentment that isn't actually really there in order to further their agenda. Yeah, no, agreed. I think, you know, it fits in well with what Charlie Kirk was saying earlier about, you know, LGBTQ uh, indoctrination being slapped in people's faces. But it speaks to like the true conservative ideology and the way they conceptualize the world as a zero sum game. And so that the inclusion of people of color, the inclusion of gay people into these spaces is inherently discriminatory against them in their minds. And that's why, or, you know, using gay marriage as an example, one of their big arguments against it was that, like, allowing gay people to get married would inherently, you know, uh, devalue the sanctity of straight marriage or their marriage in general. It's they can't speak to, or rather, they're like, shallow hand waves towards like equality are always just so easy to see through because at the end of the day like they just inherently think that if you give black people rights if you give you know lgbtq people the same rights as other people it inherently means that you are oppressing them and so you know all like the good conservative, like uh, the good conservative performativity that uh, Ben Shapiro goes through. He's like, oh yeah, but you know, lynching was terrible, but it's in the past. You know, it's all meant to appeal to that kind of Republican mentality that like, if there is any law that is targeted specifically at preventing like harm against people of color, against LGBTQ people, it's inherently oppressive against people who are, you know, you don't want to say racist because that's the only people who are like, really being oppressed by like anti-racist legislation, but inherently discriminatory against like white people who were also lynched. Remember that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I just don't understand what like, so what he tries to do here is the old, let's go into stats and try to obfuscate in a way that can make us seem like everything's fine and right, which he does on climate change and stuff like that. But I'm looking at the numbers and it's like, even if like the, the lesson that there's a lot of racist lynching, a lot of non-racist lynching, it's like, yeah, but there's a lot more racist lynching. Like I, I am down if Ben Shapiro wants to have a discussion about how particularly like um, labor organizers were lynched um, for trying to organize uh, places in like the 1880s and stuff like that. Like that stuff's interesting to me. But you look at the numbers, and this is just from the Tuskegee Institute, and it is like just vastly um, more black people than white people. Surprise! Um, in and uh, I mean just these totals that he said he was going to read them off. About 1,300 white people and 300 uh, 3,400 uh, black people. That's 1882 to 1868. And a lot of these you have to like you would 
wonder what the proportionality of that is like say a state like um arizona which is one of the outliers where it had only had 31 uh, lynchings of white people and zero of black you wonder if um we counted everyone if, if we missed a few there but maybe there's just more white people there to get lynched right so like yeah. i don't know what he's even trying to prove there and like yes we don't have uh lynchings uh like we did during jim crow we still should have anti-lynching legislation and it's insane that we don't i mean yeah, so people he, he, go, go on Brandon. i mean we still have lynchings though i mean there are all, like there are a lot of stories of mm. like black kids in the south you know being killed mysteriously not just by yeah. police and the police just not looking into it i mean this in my opinion this is like ben shapiro's uh this is the historical version of cops also shoot unarmed white people too uh you know which is supposed to just like torpedo the conversation because in their minds it's entirely based on race when you know we as people on the left know that it's a complex like interwoven system of like oppression and also just like individuals out there who have you know been deputized by our society to enforce the law uh which oftentimes means enforcing like a racially codified or racially cast society. And so like, you know, I would argue that a lot of the anti lynching movements of the like, you know, early part of the century became like prison abolition, police abolition movements as mm. well, because those two things are very interwoven. And we know that the right does not have any real interest in that particular, you know, that particular conversation either. Yeah, they, they, they create a definition that's so narrow and so uh, out of date that it allows for real uh, murders and systemic racism to go by the like, wayside. Like he wouldn't categorize Eric Garner or Ahmaud Arbery as lynchings, right? But I mean, the the, the that is uh, the modern day version of it. Uh, not to paraphrase the 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 words of of Clarence Thomas, but that unlike in his case mine kind of applies i will say though the last time i heard of anti-lynching legislation being used was in a case where it was actually used against black people who you know i think in california there's anti-lynching legislation that specifically defines it as like a mob of people quote unquote taking mm. extrajudicial action and you know in the case of like you know there is the police have arrested somebody and a mob of just a justice mob or whatever kind of mob comes and takes the black person from the police and like lynches them in this case it was you know basically a group of black people unarresting an activist that the police had un, like unjustly uh, arrested and they were charged with the like with anti-lynching laws and so a lot of ways even anti-lynching laws once you know they are filtered through our racist police state uh become tools of like you know basically you not lynching people but tools of racial oppression so i mean the question of like why are they so bent out of shape over legislation that may or may not actually even ever be used is because they can't even stand like the idea that there might be some kind of law in the books that you know equalizes things for uh, across racial lines which it, it definitely won't do right can you guys hear me yeah we can hear yeah, what's you going okay on cool because I, I guess my connection was uh yeah i don't know what was going on there but um i was looking at some of the uh specifics of those uh mid 1800s lynchings that were of white people that ben shapiro classified as non-racist lynchings and this is interesting because, uh, i bet you i know um, what that is they're probably like 60, yeah, pro integration right 16 of those lynchings were of suspected union supporters in oh, texas okay. um yeah. one was literally the lynching of an abolitionist newspaper publisher uh, uh -huh. so yeah those non-racist lynchings were very much racist yeah they were white supremacists yeah exactly exactly yeah. i mean anyone needs to like read what's who, who's the guy who wrote a uh, reconstruction um the uh, eric foner like i mean this is all history we should be uh familiar more familiar with be uh, um as familiar uh, with as we are of the civil war which was like again like sort of a revolution against uh, uh slavery but then you had the uh restoration of white supremacy afterwards and uh, we don't talk enough about that right we definitely don't because like you know as matt was saying white supremacy i think has been mystified by you know i guess <laughs> what the right wing would say years of crt but i would say is years of like inadequate like you know basic education about america's history uh you know it's mystified the fact that white supremacy is not as simple as just like black people being killed by extrajudicial mobs of white like clansmen it's a you know it's a system you know a, a racial system that also includes other races and white people but it's not you know it's not doesn't just describe the relationship that white people have 
with black people as an underclass. Yep. All right, let's take um, another call. Do, 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 do. Um, calling from a 208 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? This is Sean calling from Washington. Sean from Washington. What's on your mind? Well, I wanted to talk to Sam about his slander of the Oval Apple. Okay. But uh, can you hear, can you hear me? Okay, I'm in a room with no carpeting or anything because I'm working on my house. Yeah, you're okay. You're a little echoey, but it's not too bad. You find the carpeted space. Anyway, I wanted to just share a little bit about some of the discussion you were having about teachers' unions the other day and uh, healthcare with yeah. negotiating. Mm -hmm. And I do a lot of work in my union at a local level. I'm a state representative and I'm a national representative for the largest teachers' union in the country, the NEA. Right. And I also do some work with a thing we have called a Uniserve Council, which is a cadre of professional organizers who support the organizing goals of the, the member teachers because we're, you know, busy. And um, I think a lot of the, the there, there's a huge disconnect in our union, I think. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with the people who are part of the union for the individual support or because they believe in it, but are not particularly involved. And with the people who actually go out and, and take the effort to become reps or to, or to become otherwise involved in the organizational structure of the union. Okay. And because re between rank and file members, the support for universal health care is overwhelming. Yeah. And when you go to any of our national conferences, you go to anything like that, the rhetoric is wholly about transferring from this business union model over to more of an industrial union model to pursue goals centered around racial equity, uh, combating these, these trans harassment bills, essentially. Yeah. Um, and then when you get to the national and see how people uh, in power actually behave, it becomes clear that there's a huge body of this progressive energy that is completely led by a bunch of people who see themselves as being in proximity to power or is really working as an organ, uh, as an organ of the Democratic Party. And I think that's well illustrated during the last presidential election. Um, there's when um, our former president, Lilius Kelsen Garcia, as a member of the DNC, along with Randy Weingartner for the AFT, um, actually voted against the inclusion of Medicare for All in the Democratic yep. platform. And I, I, part of me wonders um, about whether or not people are just afraid, really just afraid of what we would have to do to be able to provide tangible benefits to members in the absence of negotiating benefits. Because I think the overwhelming consensus is that our union serves as a body that gets you a cost of living adjustment every three to five years, um, barring large legislation or court decisions like the McCleary decision we had here in Washington that dumped tens of billions into, into, into funding. Um, and I, I think there's this idea that there would be a large vacuum where it's like, we, it, and it's absolutely right, we would be free to do so much more if we didn't have to negotiate these basic benefits. But then you have to answer the question of what that would be. And yeah. that would mean taking some pretty uh, politicized and some pretty tough uh, actions or positions. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm down, I'm down for the fight, but I don't know how many people are. And I, I mean, a lot of that has to do with just being overworked. And a lot of it has to do with that there's a lot of Republicans and conservatives who are in education, but who are totally fine with paying union dues because they understand that it secures them, you know, legal representation and, and, and pay benefits. Yeah. I mean, and, and to, to your point in terms of leadership, that's something I've been saying for a while. Like, you know, I, I, I have no doubt that the, um, the rank and file, as you say, like the in many unions, are uh, way more gung ho about um, universal health care, single payer, as opposed to the ossified leadership, where especially someone like Randy Weingarten, right? Like they have political connections, they've made their particular connections decades previously um, with politicians who don't support those kinds of things. And they see it as a way to attract members. Um, and as opposed to like the larger understanding of, of 
workers negotiating with their employer where there's more bargaining power if one has their health care coverage secured as opposed to being contingent upon their employment status. So, I mean, your point's really well taken. And um, I think it's very nuanced because when I bring up this point, I don't want it to I don't want to look like I'm attacking unions in any way. But I do think that leadership well, leadership in many of these unions came into existence during a time when uh the the power of unions were diminished so severely and like i think there needs to be more aggressive people at the top if that makes sense well surely and i you know i think um uh, the teaching teaching is i think is a really interesting thing to look into for i mean i, I mean if there's any guests you guys know of who could talk about the history of education unions and that kind of thing because it, it's a really interesting model because we don't really serve an administrative function like a regular public sector union would that has, you know, like we process, pay, you know, we process something and we don't create a product that can be sold or, or evaluated at value, but we do serve a purpose um, that is 100%, you know, vital and, and necessary to have any sort of, any sort of representative democracy or, or civil society at all. Yeah. And uh, the, our organizing largely stems from a history of the very gendered history um, and getting away from things where like, you couldn't become a teacher unless you were like a single woman who signed a contract to not date a lot of things. So a lot of the, the history of teaching uh, teachers unions and that kind of thing comes not really from trying to negotiate better pay, but really just trying to negotiate basic workers' rights at, at just, you know, in, in, as, a, as a person, as a citizen. Yeah. Because um, they were highly limited in those, in those cases. Well, Sean, I really appreciate your call. Thanks so much. Hey, thanks. Hey, Brandon, check your uh, DMs. I'm gonna let's uh, let's let's uh, let's set this password and uh, scrap Volcano Manor. Let's do it. Oh, that you're the one who sent me that. Okay. That was me. Where this you said 112, I'm 113, and I suck at PvP. So let's go. It's okay. That's you know, it's fine. Okay. Uh, well, oh. I need all right. Letting you go, Sean, but I need some context on that. What the hell are you guys talking about? Elden Ring, you know. Uh, oh. He wants to. He wants the PVP in Elden Ring. I'm not a big PVP or in Elden Ring. I like to, you know, set myself against the landscape and just let let loose. Uh, but yeah. I'm, I'm always willing to scrap. I'm not one to shy down from a challenge. I uh, I want to play that, but I don't have a console. Um, and like maybe I'll. It's just not at the top of my priorities in terms of purchases. Uh, so, but like, maybe I'll get what's, one. What's and... on the top of an Emma Vigland purchase list? I'm saving up for a new mattress right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. I it's a, not I even like, mattress. it's not even fun, but I just, I'm having terrible sleep issues right now. And it's because my mattress is so old. So. Wait, you still can't just buy a PlayStation. That's crazy. Really? I, I, I got mine first try. I was very excited by that. You know. What supply chain? issues yeah it's 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 funny i was walking by GameStop the other day and it's like out uh december 2020 it's like it is march 2022 and you still don't have those in stock all right let's get let's take one more call and this will be the final call of the day and then we'll read some ims and get out of here i think i know who this is calling from a 917 area code i think we were chilling at the live show who's this Hi, this is Alex from New York. Alex yeah. from New York. Nice meeting you. I can watch you. How you doing? I'm doing good. All um, right. Well, good to meet you uh, over the weekend. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. That was a great show. Uh, the height disparities between what it looks like on camera. You and Sam, I, pretty normal. But, like, Matt, I did not expect to be that tall. Matt is and, tall, yeah. Uh, and and Bender and Brandon, I did not expect to be less tall. Um, <laughs> I am average height. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, wow, yes, uh, wow, dude. All right, um, go ahead. I feel that, but let me give you let me give you the Fight Club names. Okay. Uh, for today, we're gonna do. Uh, my pen. Let's do Candace Owens uh, versus I don't Michelle Malkin. Candace Owens versus Michelle Malkin. And, yeah, and Tom Cotton versus Jim Jordan. Tom Cotton versus. Okay. Jo I think Jordan. 
Yeah, D- Jim Jordan. He's called Jim G Y M for a reason. So Jim Jordan wins. And then who versus Michelle Malkin? Candace Owens. Candace Owens. Michelle yeah. Malkin. I think Candace. Candace is a lightweight. I think Malkin is too, though. I don't know. I've seen. Man. I remember Malkin doing Michelle a really embarrassing. Malkin's hanging out with. Uh, your connection's a little bad, Bender. Hard I just want to say I can't believe this show is still supporting violence after the uh, bloodbath at the Oscars. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. I think Michelle. Ah, uh, Bender. Uh, Bender, we might have to lose you. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, Alex, and good meeting you, man. Um, but uh, yeah, I yeah, take, you too. Have a good day. Yeah. I take uh, I take Jim Jordan, uh, and I take Candace Owens. Cause why do you take Candace Owens? Because I. I'm basing it pretty much entirely on this this thing Michelle Malkin did um, as a cheerleader, um, where she it was a really unfunny um, comedy bit. Maybe I can pull it up really fast. Um, but it just it, it, no one who did that was going to ever win a fight. Um, oh, here we go. Okay, so Pom Pom Pelosi. Oh God, I remember this. Oh, they don't actually link to the video here though. So. It's somewhere on uh, it's somewhere on on YouTube, but yeah. Anyway, all right, let's read some IMs and then we will get out of here. Sorry, guys, that was the final call. I'm gonna hang up the phones. Matt Matt oh. Bender got digitally, I don't want to say digitally lynched, so I would say canceled uh, for his for his consistent anti crypto uh, positions. Do you remember yeah. when Donald Trump said he was being lynched when he was president? I forget what the exact um, reason why it was. Yeah, I but- forget too. Uh, it was like December, so I, I want to say it was after he had COVID, and he was, you know, I'm being, uh, huh. yeah, well, it's probably not important. Tim poops in the pool. Uh, writes in, uh, when I think about the devolution of reality TV, the first show I think of is The Mass Singer. I'm not sure what it is, but that show feels like an affront to my dignity as a human. Part of it is definitely how they bring on people that are actively trying to destroy democracy. I can't get down with that. Also, devolution of reality TV and oxymoron. Yeah, it's like super... Um, I mean, didn't they walk off when... Who was the... Was it Giuliani? Giuliani. Did yeah. they air that yet? I've been waiting. I've been waiting for I, a while from there. air it. I don't know because I, I mean, they, they, Sean Spicer was, a, no, he was a, re, uh, he was a uh, contestant. Dancing, with, Dancing the with the Stars. But that's both, that's ABC too. Like ABC has zero problem with uh, conservatives. That's just like a very conservative network comparatively. Not that like NBC is a bastion of progressivism, but it's comparatively not as pro right wing. Yeah. ABC is like a part of Disney that wants to like take it easy on all the gay people hugging in the background. Right. So, <laughs> no. But, but the mass singer is like a really bad acid trip, basically. I, I don't know. I don't know if you can ac- accurately call it a devolution because, like, for me, the height of reality TV was in the early 2000s. And going back to it, like, problematic would be to put it lightly. And really, they're just bad in worse, less interesting ways, or rather, different, less interesting ways. Like, every, yeah. every show now is like the mass singer. You know, <laughs> I, I think there's like the mass dancer, the mass break dancer, the mass singer, the mass magician. You know, anything, any talent type show they used to have before that was unmasked is now being done masked. Mass dating. It's mass honestly, co- it's uh, that's the precursor to COVID. They masked everyone, now they're masking us. All the good reality TV shows have gone to the UK where they're not afraid to be still be problematic. You know, they're not afraid to not <laughs> oh, be woke. Oh, wait, Mass Singer's Fox. All right, I'm an idiot. All right, never mind. Um, I found the Michelle Malkin uh, cheerleader video. Okay. It might take a- Wrong thing. This war is lost. This war is lost. This war is lost. I think that was Harry Reid talking about the war in Iraq, which mm-hmm. was uh, absolutely correct. <laughs> and this is Michelle Malkin calling him a defeatocrat, which uh, if you weren't around for the 2000s, that's what conservatism was like. Give me an O! Give me an O! Give me an F! Give me an E. Give me an R. Mm, this is what wild. Is it Harry, read. Failure, defeat. Surrender, surrender. Go donkeys, go. So yeah, that's conservative comedy for you. <laughs> you know what's funny about that? Not not the it the thing itself, obviously, but. 
you know, this is what conservatives mean when they're not, you, they say you're not allowed to do comedy anymore. But what mm-hmm. they want you to think of is like the heyday of like the Daily Show with like Jon Stewart and like the Colbert Report. And when like Lewis Black was coming out with a new like comedy special every other week in 2004 or five. And now it's just like, this is what, but this is what they really mean they're protecting. <laughs> like those kinds of like terrible, terrible bits that, you know, conservatives like Steven Crowder do. Yeah. And really, like, I mean, I just got to be honest. I've done a lot of things in my past in order to justify wearing an outfit I thought looked cute on me. Um, that's kind of what this was. Yeah. A little bit shameless. A yeah. Little bit, a little bit uh, grasping by a it, it, She wanted to wear the cheerleader outfit and she found a way to do it. Yeah. The idea comes sort of second. It's kind of like Dave Rubin and the, um, uh-huh. uh, 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 what's it? Um, the Darlene Rudin. What are you two crazy bitches talking about? Yeah, kind of the, the writing comes second to the dressing up. <laughs> yep, I mean, and that's Crowder's whole persona. Uh, let's read like 10 more IMs and then we will get out of here. Glass Siegel highly recommend John Stewart's segment on CRT with Andrew Sullivan and a couple experts. Not only did, did John and guests defend the merits of CRT, which is rare. They made Sullivan look like an idiot, but also got him to admit his idea of what holds back black people boils down to their culture is worse and nothing else. Okay. Always, yeah. I mean, there's no new contours to this particular road. Yeah. I just feel Maybe like we're going to be... Go on. Other. I mean, I just feel like we're going to be watching like experts explain the basics of biology to Andrew Sullivan and like associated race scientists who have like a middle school grasp of it for the rest of eternity. And that's just like troubling. But, right. you know, it's still funny sometimes. Odd homonym. I was listening to Glenn Beck over the weekend. He was talking about this Disney thing and openly lamenting that the workers are in charge and not the CEOs. It was wild that he was so blatant. Wow. Yeah, you're not supposed to put it that uh, pointedly. Yeah, I'm. I'm. We should look that up. Uh, oh, and Bra- Bradley says the lynching thing was the first impeachment. There you go. Oh yes. Oh, right. The first mm. one. The first one. Um. Bourbon socialist. I wish people like Charlie Kirk would just come clean about the fact that they hate gay people. They clearly think it's fine to show kids portrayal of men kissing women, but when it's two men and two women, it's suddenly indoctrination. They should just, well, because they perceive men and women being together as very natural and the natural state of things. Um, They should say with their chest that they're okay with indoctrinating kids with images of men kissing women because they hate gay people and don't want it remotely normalized rather than pretending they're concerned about kids. Congressional base. Baseball fan. Uh, I recently went to visit family in rural uh, eastern New Mexico where I stopped at a local junk seller shop and they were selling both ivermectin, those free COVID antigen tests you can get from the USPS, but they were selling the test for $19 a box. I think they were literally selling the free tests they ordered. Never underestimate the ability of small business owners to find profit and opportunism. Mike Oxlong. Uh, God, fuck. (laughs) It's it's not bad. It's not bad. Can't help but notice that the sexuality is conversion for kids to have their parents crowd. Apparently can't uh, to have with sexuality is a conversation. I'm sorry for kids to have with their parents crowd. Apparently can't fathom explaining two men kissing to their kids. Yeah. Also can't help noticing that their most prominent voices like Ben Shapiro and Steven Crowder are consistently waiting until marriage as a point of pride. Makes I'm me sorry. wonder if conservatives are so down on sex for the same reason they're down on drugs because no one ever offered them any. A uh, wet what now? Yeah, you're having kids talking about wet. Your teachers talking about wet. You know what? We can't have this. Yeah. Um. Ben Shapiro's like, sex is for the bedroom with your married wife and in the dark so she doesn't get to look at you and you don't get to look at her. And yeah. uh, They hide that part. Of their... consummation. There's, consummation. There's an insane story that it's very short. It looks like we'll have to follow up on this tomorrow, but just a headline. A police find five fetuses at the home of anti-abortion activists in Washington, D.C. A shocking discovery at the home of anti-abortion uh, protester Lauren Handy comes the wow. same day she was indicted with eight others on federal charges after storming a D.C. abortion clinic in 2020. Apparently, a reporter is like, what did they take? Asked her uh, what they took out of her house. And she just said, uh, people are going to freak out when they find out. Police have discovered five fetuses at the home of the anti-abortion activists. Uh, D.C. police told WUSA 9 that officers made the shocking discovery during a raid on the property in Capitol Hill on Wednesday afternoon. So, interesting. Well, I mean... 
that's anti-abortion folks for you so we've been looking into more, what the hell's going on there yeah um And Troma, I'm in Richmond, Virginia, and we've had multiple tornadoes touch down in the last hour. Wishing, watching the show until I lose power or internet. Wish me luck. Good luck. Um, Murray the Orc. Hey, I'm Majority Report crew. I had a two-year-long relationship end yesterday, and today I totaled my car. I'm fine, but when I opened the door to get out, my dog jumped out and ran away. Oh. They're just about done replacing the telephone pole I destroyed, so all the loud trucks should clear out soon, so I'll take her brother down and see if we can sniff her out, hoping she's just got spooked and settled down in the brush somewhere, just asking y'all to keep this orc and his faithful hound in your thoughts. I'm hoping to see her home. Oh, man. I'm so, so sorry, Murray the Orc. Um, that's a really difficult few days for you. I'm so sorry. I really hope your pup's okay. I mean, the breakup probably for the better, just just taking this probabilistically, but... Uh... Yeah, sorry about the pet. Yeah. Um. I five a new mattress on my well, 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 hoity toity. <laughs> and I'm still using the extra one from my mom's house, uh, and I have like two mattress pads on it to make it even sleepable. That's the that's the cul de sac life for you. All right. Five more. Emma in the shadows. Folks, the vibe is weird now after the last caller height shame Brandon and Binder. I want to mm-hmm. say that short and average height people matter, and I love you regardless of stature. Also, Emma needs better lighting. I take no offense to the height shaming. You know, some people in the crowd might, but I, I'm, I'm not sensitive about my average height. <laughs> I, I, I didn't even, it, like, yeah, that, that thought didn't occur to me. Alex? Um, it's like a 4 Al- meme. Right. Apple of my eyes wide shut. I'll put good money on whoever going to school meetings, uh, on whoever going to school meetings asking for litter boxes to be installed is actually conservative trying to smear the LGBTQ. Yes. Yeah. Um, John McCain's ghost. My dear friend Lindsay is an Air Force guy, and I know he'll really benefit from some firsthand combat flight experience, but unfortunately, he's not much of a pilot, and I really know all about destroying airplanes. Anyway, do you know any Beach Boys songs that might rhyme with Russia, maybe Moscow? Don't get, I don't get it, but I appreciate the effort. Nightmare Sabe Day rotation. Emma, thank God you shared your opinion about Lafayette. A bunch of stupid right, white rich kids is right. I'm on a delay. You don't have to read this. LOL. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just like I, I just wish I didn't make the dis. I, I went to that college. Uh, be close to an ex. Bad decision making when you're 18, <laughs> right? So, but I have some great friends that came out of there. It's just like overall, I found the scene to be a little much. Um, all right. I'm looking for the final I am of the day. <clears throat> I five. Charlie Kirk is calling for physical. Charlie Kirk calling for physical preventing trans athletes from competing is important in my humble opinion. I hate to do a Martin Nemo roller, but the first they came for the this is brown shirt tactics. When you um, start pulling people out of the crowd, you begin with the most marginalized, the most vulnerable with the least protection. Solidarity is the only way forward. Oh, and Charlie Kirk has chosen sides. He stands with fascism. Yeah, exactly. That's oh, Definitely. Yeah. 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 They're using uh, the, this all this anti-trans bigotry to just launder more bigotry. It's just the easiest place to start. Yeah, you know, I mean, honestly, our society is not moving towards any true egalitarian, but even this, like, the mild amount of, like, social inclusion that people notice around them is enough to set them on edge, you know. And to be fair, they're always attacking all vectors all the time, but they're allowed to pretend, like, when they latch on to one that people are sort of sympathetic to that, oh, yeah, forget about the fact that they're also waging war on, like, Black people and also yeah. waging war on gay people constantly and also always raging war on immigrants. This is their own, they're, like, they're working in good faith on this one. And so, you know, but they're just always looking for vectors to, like, launder in their just generally, you know, you'd say it, backwards ideology. Yes. All right, folks, uh, Binder and Abstentia, Brandon, Bradley, and Matt, thank you guys so much today. Um, and also, you know, thanks again for a uh, good time at the live show, Brandon. Really appreciate it. I appreciate it, too. I appreciate all the followers I got from you posting our rap video, uh, or rather our rap album cover photo. Yes, Julie just sent me some more photos now, though, so uh, we might have the full gambit soon enough. Thanks so much, guys.
We will see you tomorrow. It's April Fool's Day, but of a special episode. Bye bye. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm gonna get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the life bar. But finding out won't make me feel any better. Yeah, I know. Choice was made for the option where you don't get paid.